Services and Intergovernmental Relations. Members met to discuss ways to curb violence and its cost to society. This hearing is chaired by Congressman Adolphus Towns of New York. The Committee on Government Operations, Subcommittee on Human Resources, and Intergovernmental Relations hearing will come to order. The hearing today is on violence as a public health issue. We will continue the subcommittee series of hearings on issues related to health care reform. Our society is self-destructuring. As a consequence of violence that engulf families, neighborhood, and communities, many Americans are paralyzed with fear about the prospects of becoming a victim of violence or having to live or work in close proximity to potential violence. Violence has moved from an issue solely within the criminal justice system to the health care arena. This change is largely due to the geometric increase in deaths and injuries due to gun violence. Nowhere in this situation more evident than with America's youth. The Federal Center for Disease Control and Prevention reports that firearms have accounted for more than 90 percent of the upturn in homicides in young Americans since the mid-1980s. A recent Washington Post article reported that guns kill more teenagers than cancer, heart disease, AIDS, and other disease combined. In some states, teenagers are even more likely to die from a bullet than they are a traffic accident. For black youth, the statistics are even more shocking. The homicide rate among black men aged 15 to 24 rose by 66% during the 1980s. 95% of the increase was a direct result of violence. Gun sales are spiraling as evidenced by the number of Americans arming themselves against an anticipated but unknown, unknown assailant. But violence is not limited to guns. Throughout our nation, there are numerous examples of elderly in nursing homes and children in hospitals whose circumstances warrant attention, but whose voices and complaints go unheeded. Just this past week, the president declared the month of October 1993 and 1994 to be National Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Domestic violence is more than the occasional, occasional family dispute. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, it is the single largest cause of injury of American women, affecting six million of a racial, cultural, and economic backgrounds. The cost of violence is not only in human lives, but there's also a cost in real dollars and cents. As President Clinton stated recently, violence crowds our emergency rooms and drain our medical resources. Victims of violence almost always end up in the nation's emergency rooms. And I can tell you, as a former health care administrator, that receiving care in an emergency room setting is probably the most expensive form of health care available today. Today's hearing will explore not just the problems of violence, but how it impacts the daily lives of ordinary American citizens. We'll hear from the actual victims of violence about the impact of violence on their lives and how that has changed them. We will also hear from researchers and health care providers who are concerned about the additional socioeconomic costs to society and the burden of the health care delivery system. Finally, the subcommittee 
plans additional hearings on this topic next year when the President announces his anti-violence strategy. Today we are honored to have the top public health officer in the nation to discuss with us the administration's focus and plans for addressing the prevention of violence. But before moving forward and hearing the Surgeon General, Dr. Johnson Elders, I would like to recognize my colleague um, uh, from the state of New Jersey, who uh, person that's been very active in, uh, on all these issues and one that's very compassionate and has said over and over again uh, that we must do something about the violence in our nation. I now yield to Congressman Donald Payne from New Jersey. <laughs> Congressman Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me first commend you for your leadership in calling this very important hearing this morning. I would also like to commend Dr. Elders, the Surgeon General, for her commitment and leadership to bringing this issue to the forefront of our public health agenda. Also, I look forward to hearing Congressman Lewis Stokes, who last year called for the creation of a select committee on violence and has held a number of meetings and hearings regarding the question of violence as a public health problem. And I want to extend my regards to the panel of witnesses who have agreed to provide us with their testimony this morning, especially our young people who are the victims. Violence is becoming an increasingly great public health threat in this country. Every one of us in this room today knows about the startling statistics regarding violence in our nation. We all know that homicide is the number one cause of death among African American males aged 15 to 34 and is the leading cause of death among black male and females between the age of 15 and 24. Violence is so well integrated into our culture that every six minutes an act of violence is depicted on television. Such statistics are evident, are evidence of the threat of violence in our society. But what about the threat to our public health? More than one million women are impacted each year by domestic violence, not to mention those who are assaulted by strangers. Rapes feed into the growing fear and threat of AIDS in this country. Additionally, the cost of violent incidents to our nation's trauma centers and hospital emergency rooms is fueling the escalating cost of our health care system. Violence incurs great physical and psychological consequences on our society. The widespread nature of these consequences may indicate that violence has become a routine part of social interaction in our daily lives. As a result, it may also have become the adopted and accepted mode of behavior by current and future generations. We can see this in the increased number of violent acts committed by today's youth. During the 1980s, youth between the age of 12 and 24 committed more than 48,000 homicides, and nearly half of the 4.2 million non-fatal violent acts. Law enforcement efforts as a result of the epidemic numbers of rampant violence have been increased. However, these acts are merely the symptom of a larger problem. And until we as a nation get ready to confront the real issues underscoring the nature of violence in this country, this very dangerous and unhealthy trend will continue. I want to emphasize the importance of not letting our interest or our involvement stop at the conclusion of this forum. As we have heard the chairman say, this is just the beginning and we will continue. It is imperative that the very survival of our community, it is, it is imperative to the very survival of our community that we not be impeded by the size of the problem. We have to take steps to counteract the circumstances that erodes our children's self-image and self-respect. Again, Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank you for calling this hearing and let me just finally draw attention to a first page article in the Washington Post today. It says, getting ready to die young. And it talks about the fact that it's not uncommon for young children, 10, 11, 9, 13, to start to plan their deaths. They talk about the dresses that they want to wear. They 
talk about the songs they want to be played. They talk about how they want the flowers to be arranged and what they want their classmates to wear. We must do something drastically to stop this insane trend. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Payne. I agree with you. That is a sad commentary and that we must do something about it. At this time, I would like to call on uh, uh, Dr. Elders, who is the Surgeon General, and to say to her that her entire statement will be included in the record, and we're delighted to have you to come and to uh, testify uh, before this committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman Towns. Congressman Towns, other members of the Subcommittee on Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations of the House Committee on Governmental Operations. I'm Dr. Joycelyn Elders, your Surgeon General. I'm a pediatrician, a mother, a teacher, and a citizen in a country and a city where violence has reached epidemic proportions. You've asked me here today to talk about violence as a public health issue, particularly the public health consequences of violence. Our efforts at prevention and the implications for health care professionals and institutions. We ordinarily think of violence as a crime, and it is, but it's also a public health problem because it kills and injures so many of our people, especially our young people and our children. In 1987, there were over 20,000 homicides and 31,000 suicides in this country. That's over 50,000 deaths per year, a one every 10 minutes, and 137 per day. It's greater than the deaths caused by AIDS which is over 33,000 per year, one every 16 minutes, or 90 per day. It's greater than that caused by drunk driving, nearly 18,000 people per year, or one every 30 minutes, or 49 per day. Rape increased 21% from 1977 to 1984 and 20% of adult women have been physically abused at least once. Second, violence must be considered a public health problem because the criminal justice approach is not enough. It treats the problem after it occurs. Our prisons are overcrowded, our courts are backlogged, and our police are overworked, and still our streets are not safe. We must couple prevention with our criminal justice system of treatment. Finally, violence is a public health problem because it's a problem to be solved and must not be considered a fact of life. Violence is preventable. It is a learned behavior. As your Surgeon General, I'm about preventing problems before they happen. Violence has public health consequences. In recent years, there has been an extraordinarily increased rate of both homicide and suicide among our young people, as both you and Dr. Payne, or Mr. Payne, have just stated. Since the 1950s, Suicide rates among our youth have almost quadrupled, and homicide rates among young men are 20 times higher as most industrialized countries. And if we just look at our young black men, it's 40 times higher than in the next industrialized country. As these rates have increased, the average age of both the perpetrators and the victims have fallen 
so that today we have a problem of children killing children. Today in America, 14 children under the age of 19 will die in suicides, homicides, or accidental shootings. Many more than that will be injured. Whereas we have over 20,000 deaths, we have over 2 million injuries secondary to violence. 57% of all African American teenagers who died in 1990 were killed with guns. This is up from 48% in 1988. Children are killing children. To me, as your Surgeon General, this is totally unacceptable. If we are to have true security in health care reform, we must restore security in our homes, our schools, our streets, and our nation. The cost to this country are too great to be ignored. The cost of firearm injuries alone to our health care system is nearly $3 billion a year. The total medical cost of all violence in the United States was $13.5 billion in 1992. In the District of Columbia, our nation's capital, the cost of criminal violence to hospitals totaled $20.4 million in 1989, and we all know that it's markedly increased today. The vast majority, 85% of the hospital cost for treatment of firearm injuries were on reimbursed care. In addition to the financial cost, the emotional and psychological cost or enormous. What causes violence and what can we do to prevent it? Although many factors contribute to this epidemic, at its root is poverty. And one of the things that bothered me so much recently, that in 1970 we knew that one out of seven of our children were poor. In 1990, it was one in five. In 1992, just two years later, it was one in four. In fact, 27% of all the children in America under six were poor. And then if we looked at minority children, it's one in two. Related to the poverty are changing family structures, the plight of our inner cities, the difficulties in our schools. Other key factors are the availability of alcohol, drugs, and firearms to our children. There are over 200 million firearms in this country, 67 million handguns and over one million semi-automatic assault weapons. It is often easier for our children to obtain a gun than it is for them to find a good friend, a good teacher, or a good school, or even a minister. I already testified before this Congress on the role of the media the entertainment industry can play a major role in impacting this problem by airing pro-social programs, by helping with public service announcements, by showing the emotional consequences of violence. And I feel that our media, the most powerful tool we've got to reach all of our people, must respond and help with this major problem of more significance is the violence our children are exposed to in their homes, their communities, and on the streets. The newscast is very real to them. Too many of our children witness fighting among their parents, and unfortunately, 
Too many see one parent beaten or murdered. These scars last a lifetime. So what can we do to prevent this tragic health problem? One of the first things I feel we can and must do, we must take the tools of violence out of the hands of our children. And Mr. Chairman, I feel that you can do much to help with that. Secondly, we must incorporate violence prevention into our school curriculum. I'm convinced the schools offer us the easiest and best way to reach as many of our children as possible. We must educate our parents, beginning even with prenatal classes. We must teach them how to teach their children. We must offer and support early childhood education classes. We know that children who are started early and have a good start are far less likely to be in our prison system or to fall behind in school. So we must support programs like Head Start. We must provide comprehensive health education programs in our schools from kindergarten through 12th grade, making violence in curricular an important part of that curriculum. The final shot of prevention is what I label hope. We must develop programs to train our young people and make jobs available for them. I'm concerned that children today are not learning the skills they need to be employable and productive in today's workforce. I'm worried that one-fourth of all young African-American males aged 20 to 29 are incarcerated or on probation or on parole, whereas only one out of five are enrolled in higher education. These, I feel, are major problems which we must begin to address. You ask me to speak about the implications for healthcare professionals. I join with my predecessor, Surgeon Generals, in urging our colleagues to recognize violence as a public health threat and as a potential immediate threat to all of our patients. Let me add, when I talk about health professionals, I'm talking about all of us. We all must become involved if we want to make a difference. And I would, in closing, I want to highlight what we can do together. I feel we must care. We must care enough to change our concern about the problem into a commitment. We must have the courage to do what we know we need to do to save the most valuable resource we'll ever have, our children. We must change from concern to commitment by using all the tools of commitment. We must give of our time. We must give of our talents. And we must give of our treasures to begin to fight this major public health problem that's in our community. We are aware of the problem. We must make our entire society aware of this problem. We must become advocates for the problems that we see as violence. And we must develop action plans that fit all of our communities, using all of the resources that are out there and are available to us. We must each reach out and be responsible for what's going on. We must use the resources of this government, the resources of our schools, the resources of our churches, and we must all join in this battle to deal with this major problem of violence. And lastly, Mr. Chairman, I feel we must educate and empower our entire society to be join in this battle to fight this major problem that's wiping out the most valuable resource we'll ever have, our bright young people. And I, as your Surgeon General, will be more than willing to lead this fight 
to try and turn this major problem around in our society. Thank you for our inviting me to be a part of this conference. Let me, let me thank you uh, for that very powerful testimony. Uh, I think that uh, uh, some of the things you're saying are things that really need to be done and need to be done right away. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that you've uh, devoted a great deal of time to this matter in your short tenure as a Surgeon General. Uh, you indicated in terms of the media and that the role that they play. I know when we talk about censorship and all of that, that uh, many people get nervous. Uh, how do you plan to deal with our networks? Because uh, uh, there is a consistent kind of feeling now that, uh, that violence that they see on television uh, 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 plays a role in what they act out in life. And uh, someone has gone far enough to say that they feel that some of the youngsters are so confused, uh, they feel that, uh, uh, that maybe if they shoot somebody, that they might star on another uh, 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 episode the next week. Because they see on television where uh, you're playing a role and you get shot and you killed uh, one week, and the next week you come back, you're a bigger star. So uh, that some people are saying that our young folks can't sort of sort out the difference and that they might even be confused. How do you plan to deal with the network recognizing that uh, censorship is always something that people get nervous about? Well, uh, Congressman, I certainly agree with what you're saying. I think that certainly, you know, I, I, you know, I know that uh, this committee has been concerned and trying to look at ways of dealing with media violence. I think that as your Surgeon General, I plan to sit down with the media and try and see what they are going to do. And I will work, be working, you know, I know the T Attorney General has been very concerned about our asking the media to police itself and to respond. We know that to date they've really not been very responsive, but I think that we've got to somehow convince them of what they're doing in destroying our bright young people. We know that it takes more than just the media. They see it in the streets, they see it on the home, but we know they see it over and over on our television. 10 to 15 times an hour, they see violence on our prime time TV, media, sometimes 10 to 20 times an hour on our Saturday morning comics, which is just for children. So we've got to ask them, to be able to, to create pro-social programs. We can't continue the way we are. They have a role to play, and we must ask them to get involved in playing that very important viral uh, role. They are the most powerful tool we've got against violence, and we've got to ask them to try and be responsive. Thank you very much, and uh, I agree with you, and I appreciate your uh, interest in the leadership, again, in that as well. Also, uh, how do you plan to work with the state and local uh, health uh, departments to be able to uh, deal with this whole public uh, violence as a public health issue? How do you plan to work with the local departments? Uh, uh, Congressman, as you know, well, there are several things that are going on now in the public health service. First of all, uh, the president uh, has asked for a, a kind of a meeting of everyone, a, a task force put together across the governments on violence. And that has been formed, they've been working, and I'm a part of that task force. But secondly, CDC, the uh, NIH, uh, as well as HRSA, have programs going on in the area of violence at the present time. They are funded, I think, approximately 20 states to try and help deal with this issue, working with our schools, working with our churches. And as you know, I'm chairman of the United Methodist Church, or honorary chairman of the United Methodist Church Shalom Zones, where the church is really getting involved one community at a time and getting all the churches regardless to the denomination involved in dealing with the whole issue of violence, getting the hospitals involved, our judges, you know, the whole involved. So we plan to really incorporate everyone into this because we need everybody, you know, we've all got to be responsible and we also have parenting uh, curricula to try and educate parents and we've developed violence curricula that can be instituted in schools, and there was um, uh, Dr. Deborah Protosteth, 
uh, which you may know from, in, from Boston has developed a curriculum that they instituted in Little Rock schools, you know, starting at our very early age. And we had several schools where this had really been a major problem and they did not have a fight in that one of the schools for a whole year. So we know that it works. So we've got to educate our children on how to deal with, how to deal with confrontation in other than violent means. Right, thank you very much. Let me just sort of raise one other question before I yield to uh, my colleague, um, uh, Congressman Payne, is that what has happened is that people see this as an urban problem. Uh, but as I look around, I see in terms of the rural areas, more and more that there's a problem with violence in the rural areas. But for some reason or another that uh, this has not been highlighted, how can we somewhere or another sort of point out uh, that this problem is not only an urban problem, that it's a rural problem, and that they will even have more difficulty if somewhere or another it is not dressed and dressed as, uh, 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 as soon as possible? Congressman, you're absolutely correct. You know, I'm from a very rural state, and by, we have one of the highest violences, you know, per capita of, of, of many states. So it certainly is both a rural and an urban problem. I feel that we've got to make our citizens aware of this problem and, and, you know, and get them all involved. I think there are a lot of people out there that would like to help and want to be involved, but they don't know how. So again, one of the things that our media could do, they could certainly begin to develop appropriate PSAs, pro-social, and reach out. I had one of my TV uh, announcers tell me one time, he says, Dr. Elders, I can reach more people in 30 seconds than you will in 30 years. My first response to be upset about that. But if we have a weapon that's that powerful, we need to find a way to use it to reach all of our people. I agree with you, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ellis. I now yield to my colleague, Congressman Payne from New Jersey. <coughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Elders. It's a pleasure to have you here. And let me just say that you've touched on a little bit, but um, uh, I think that we both uh, will agree that the services that are, the integration of services is going to be key. Uh, the medical community, churches, parents and all that uh, is important. I wonder how you will specifically use your role as Surgeon General. Uh, and could you define how you will be able to work your philosophy into the school system and with, this, uh, with these other important groups in our society? Uh, Congressman, I'm very pleased that you asked that question. I want you to know that since I've been here, I've probably spent more time meeting with education than I've spent meeting with, uh, with health and human services. But that's because we're all, we're really very concerned about getting a comprehensive health education program, which include a violence curriculum uh, into our schools. We feel that it needs to be started very early at kindergarten and, and made it age appropriate and progress through the 12th grade. So I feel that that is very critical. I think the schools are ready. Every major organization, you know, from it, that's related to schools and that's related to health has endorsed that we need a comprehensive health education program in our schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. So I think that the schools, perhaps with a little nudging and a little help from us, but that, that this is something that could happen very quickly. You know, the schools are there, the teachers are there, the students are there, and we might have to give them some resources to help them do it, but they are ready, and I think that they could far, they would say far more than and then it would, could possibly cost to say nothing about the loss of life. You know, when we look at what it costs to keep one young man in prison for one year, that would almost pay for our curriculum. Thank you very much. I also, uh, from what I understand, that uh, the Department of Health and Human Services has structured what you call a youth violence prevention initiative, which is targeting uh, youth and young adults. Uh, could you just briefly describe to us uh, what the strategy involves and whether this would also be a part of this school program? A part of uh, the Youth Violence Initiative, which is headed up by Doc, uh, Dr. Peter 
Edelman, uh, but it involved and co-chaired by uh, a person from uh, the Attorney General, Janet Reno's office, and it, ha it involves the Department of Labor, the uh, Department of uh, Justice, uh, well, all of the different departments, seven different agencies, health, human services, SAM, SAMHSA, mental health, whatever, acro in, across the entire public, not just public health agency, but across the full range of agencies. They're all, they, they've been meeting, they've really formed several different groups, broken it down to several different groups, and one of them is really specifically related to youth violence, but they also have groups on you know, um, related to adult uh, violence, abuse in the homes, and other kinds of abuse. And then under the youth violence, they also deal specifically with schools. And the Department of Education is very much a part of that. And they are going to meet with people, with communities. And again, they have, we have some small programs funded, but we really need to make this a a nationwide program because we realize that this is a problem that is really impacting our entire country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Congressman Payne. Let me just say that, um, uh, Dr. Elders, uh, I'm very pleased with your, um, your statement and your uh, intentions in terms of getting very involved and in helping to sort of coordinate some of these activities because we feel very strongly that uh, a lot of this will have to be done at the local level and that the uh, local agencies will have to be totally involved in helping to turn this around. <coughs> and your commitment and willingness to work to, uh, to assist them in every way uh, is very, very encouraging. So we appreciate your leadership. We appreciate the things that you're doing. And we look forward, this committee, to work with you to try and highlight the importance of uh, dealing with this is issue as soon as possible and to say to people that in areas that have not been hit by it the way we've been hit in some of the urban areas that it's coming and that they need to work with us to try and bring it under control now and uh, whatever you can do in terms of sort of helping to keep all of us together. This morning we're pleased um, to be able to hear from one of our senior members of the Congressional Black Caucus. And indeed, the House of Representatives is a person that is highly respected by all and heads the Brain Trust, uh, Congressional Black Caucus Brain Trust. Uh, we're delighted to invite to the witness table the Honorable Lewis Stokes from uh, Ohio. Congressman Stokes, we welcome you. Uh, we know in terms of your involvement and the fact that uh, you've been on this battlefield for a long, long time. And I appreciate your leadership, and we're delighted this morning for you to come and to testify before the subcommittee. Uh, you may proceed in any way you wish. Your entire statement will be included in the record, every period, every question mark, every I, every T. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Congressman Stokes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Towns uh, and uh, Mr. Donald Payne. And uh, let me just firstly uh, say, uh, Mr. Chairman, what an honor it is to appear here this morning and uh, to have had the advantage of hearing the excellent testimony that this subcommittee has just received from the Surgeon General of the United States. Uh, I think we are indeed fortunate to have this very uh, talented and brilliant woman now heading this particular office and leading uh, the charge now on behalf of uh, violence as a public health uh, issue uh, along with the other uh, tremendous responsibilities she's had and I just want to say that uh, it's an honor for me to follow her in this chair. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I will uh, uh, submit my full statement for the record, and I, I will uh, ask permission just to summarize my statement this time. Without objection, the entire record will be <coughs> included. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the subcommittee, Mr. Payne and others, I appreciate the opportunity to appear here to discuss a very pressing national issue, violence as a public health problem. 
As a chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus Health Brain Trust and as a member of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Labor, Health, Human Services and Education, I have a great interest in the subject matter of today. I also want to commend um, you for the leadership that you've exhibited in addressing this issue and now bringing this national health problem to the forefront. Mr. Chairman, the significance of violence as a public health problem in this country has been one of the most discussed and analyzed issues with the least amount of national call to action. As evidenced by your hearing today, it is very clear that we indeed are moving the nation's response to violence from the analysis stage to the action stage. By almost any measure you choose, violence ranks high as a public health problem. It affects all Americans and permeates every segment of American life, affecting our families, schools, hospitals, businesses, prisons, courtrooms, and churches. By almost any measure, it is an epidemic that is destroying the lives of our young people and endangering this nation's future. In the United States, violent and abusive behavior continues to be major causes of death, injury, and stress. To review the data briefly, according to the FBI Uniform Crime Report, in 1991 alone, homicides increased by 7 percent to 25,000. Rapes increased by 3 percent to 100,000. Robberies increased by 8 percent to over 690,000. Assaults increased by 3 percent to over 1 million. Mr. Chairman, truly violence has reached health epidemic proportions throughout America. In recent years, the increases in violent crime in this country have set world records. Let me take a moment to share with you a few startling statistics which clearly indicate the magnitude of our nation's problem on a global level. During 1990, no nation had a higher rate of rape than this country. The United States robbery rate was nearly 150 times higher than in Japan. Furthermore, no nation had a higher murder rate than ours. In fact, no other nation was even close. By 1991, murders in this country were more than double the murder rate in Northern Ireland, which is being ravaged by a civil war. Homicide might truly be characterized as a uniquely American affliction. Even more staggering than the usual statistics which record the incidence of violence in our country are the statistics which suggest that the incidence of violence may be divided along racial lines. In 1989, an African-American male had a lifetime probability of being a murder victim of 1 in 27, compared to a white male's probability of 1 in 205. Today, homicide has become the tenth leading cause of death in the United States. Homicide is also the second leading cause of death by injury among African Americans ages 1 to 19. And the leading cause of death for African American males and females ages 15 to 34. Not cancer, not cardiovascular disease, not stroke. Homicide is a leading cause of death for our young people. Similarly, for Hispanic and Native Americans, the risk of homicide is also great. In the Southwest, the homicide rate for Hispanic males was determined to be three times that of non-Hispanic whites. For Native Americans and Alaska Natives, the rates of homicide were twice that of the rate for all Americans. While we are experiencing what happens or appears to be increased violence in different population groups and in certain areas of the country, the reality of violence is that it occurs throughout America and not exclusively in the inner city communities. Moreover, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, as I'm sure you would agree, it is distressing to see that far too many Americans, including many of our congressional colleagues, are still addressing violence from a strictly punitive viewpoint. They are not considering the underlying factors precipitating violent behavior. For the poor, the disadvantaged, and many racial and ethnic minority populations, the roots of violence and violent crime are inextricably tied to other systemic failures 
and dysfunctions in a broader socioeconomic context. Poverty, education, unemployment, and homelessness, just to name a few, are all underlying factors of violence that are contributory or causal to homicide and assaultive violence, domestic violence, child abuse, sexual assault, suicide, and firearm injury. The findings of a report recently released by the Government Accounting Office titled Reducing Youth Violence concludes that there's a lack of coordination between the federal agencies. There are not enough funds directly directed specifically towards youth violence prevention activities. And they're relying almost entirely on a criminal justice approach simply is not working. A strategic plan for a public health approach must be developed to target youth violence treatment and prevention. With the incidents of violence rapidly escalating, the need to find a solution to this dilemma is more immediate than ever. We just cannot afford to continue to ignore the fact that violence is a national health epidemic. The cost of doing nothing is far too great in health, quality of life, and economic terms. The recent report to the Congress titled Cost of Injury in the United States indicates that firearm injuries ranked third in the economic toll on society. In fact, just five years ago in 1989, they cost society $14.4 billion. If that figure alone is adjusted for no more than five years of inflation, at a minimum of 3% per year, the amount is now staggering $16.7 billion. As three of the five leading causes of premature death, injuries, homicide, and suicide are related to violence, we must support and expand violence treatment and prevention initiatives. This would ensure that local communities receive the guidance and resources they need to reverse these trends. This grim reality of violence demands an immediate national response. It is only through a collective and concentrated effort that a remedy to this grim reality will be attained. Mr. Chairman, this nation has effectively attacked a number of infectious disease epidemics. That basic blueprint and concentrated effort and resources must be applied to the violence epidemic. Violence has cast a sweeping shadow over America it requires a national call to action to eradicate. Some steps have been taken, but they alone are not enough. The Department of Health and Human Services has established a framework for reducing the incidence of youth violence. It also is developing a youth violence initiative at the Centers for Disease Control and other agencies. And these initiatives must be put on the fast track. An excerpt taken from Dr. Deborah Prothero Stith's book entitled Deadly Consequences aptly describes the challenges that we face today. In this passage, Dr. Prothero Stith quotes a woman whose two sons were shot in the same incident. One died and one did not. The woman is quoted in Dr. Stith's book as saying, quote, the children who are dying are real kids from real families. Somebody has to wake up and see that our children are dying. My child is dead. Your child could be next. Close quotes. As Dr. Prothero Stitt notes, it is time we paid attention to these frightening words. For it is clear that incarceration of, of offenders the bandaging and burial of victims are ineffective antidotes. Our courts, jails, emergency rooms, school rooms, and family assistance programs are all feeling the pressure of the swelling epidemic. The very future of our nation depends upon how we address these issues of violence. In its simplest and most complex terms, it really is a matter of life and death. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Payne, other members of the subcommittee, we live in the nation, we put a man on the moon, and develop the oral polio vaccine. Surely we can develop 
effective diagnosis, treatment and preventive measures to solve the nation's violence health epidemic. Mr. Chairman, I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Let me thank you, Mr. Stokes, for your testimony. Uh, some very shocking uh, statistics. And, uh, and also, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for the leadership that you provided, uh, not only with, among the Congressional Black Caucus, but among the Congress uh, for, uh, in health care and helping to uh, point out that uh, this is an epidemic and that it's something that we must begin to uh, deal with it. You know, uh, as it was pointed out earlier on the front page of the Washington Post, we find that children as young as 10 years of age are planning their funerals. And that young people will say to you that I know that I will never reach the age of 21, uh, so I'm not even thinking about that. Uh, uh, let me ask you, what hope can we offer these children that uh, policymakers can end the cycle? Uh, and I feel to ask you because uh, I know you've been out here on the firing line for quite some time. Uh, what can we do now to begin to give them some hope? <coughs> I think, Mr. Chairman, that, that uh, we must begin to work with our local communities. Uh, we must begin to work with uh, those who uh, have formerly been gang leaders, members of gangs, who now want very badly to reform the system. They want help. They're reaching and crying out. During the Congressional Black Caucus weekend, we conducted a, a hearing on violence and the Health Brain Trust. We have satellite feeds into Cleveland and into Memphis, Tennessee, where we see former gang members, former gang leaders, who are now working with local police officers and local community organizations, local churches, trying to be a part of the system, trying to break themselves from a way of life that they, they knew was wrong, but which they couldn't break from without some type of societal help. We have to help them be able to do that. Congress has to fund the kind of programs that will enable us to have these kind of initiatives at the local level. We must begin uh, in our various agencies at the national level, and we must give them the kind of legislation they need as we look at national health care reform. We must make violence an integral part of the health care reform uh, practice. In the legislation which um, uh, I will be introducing in a few days, uh, which all of you are co-sponsors of um, the uh, Disadvantaged Minority Health Act, uh, which is up for renewal, uh, I hope that we will, in that legislation, be able to include some measures that help local communities be able to start fighting this problem. And let these young people know that we really care about them and their lives. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Stokes. Let me just say to you that uh, I know you're on the Appropriation Committee and that uh, you'll have to fight for it there as well. I want to let you know that we join you in that fight. I now yield to Congressman Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Stokes. As it's been indicated in the Pulse story today, it talked about the fact that in the last five years, 224 youngsters under the age of 18 have died right here in the District of Columbia. In New York City, the number of violent deaths by gunfire is at about 350 already this year. Washington, D.C. tends to have close to 500 deaths per year. In my district, in Jersey City, I just last week went to the site where the night before three young men pulled guns, shot at each other, and all three were killed by each other. It's just happening all around. Reverend Jesse Jackson, <laughs> was in New Jersey on Saturday and talked about just last week in Washington, a four-year-old girl was killed by some uh, stray gunfire. And that uh, he went on to talk about the whole, the whole uh, cycle of violence because the girl's mother was, had her at the age of 15. The grandmother was only 37, but had died from drug overdose that
the father of the four-year-old could not attend the funeral because he was in maximum security for killing a four-year-old when he was younger. And so this, this can't continue. This is genocide. It, can, it just is out, it's just, it's out of proportion. And so I would just um, say that it's sad when on 60 Minutes yesterday I saw a program where Japanese tourists are being taught uh, how to enjoy USA, but what to do about violence. That has to be a part of a tourist uh, education, you know, see the Statue of Liberty, uh, see the Capitol, but also if someone comes, let your pocketbook go and uh, how to say certain words. So I think that this nation has to become serious about it. Uh, I think that perhaps it would be more serious if in fact it was not contained to certain segments of our society. But as we saw with the drug problem, if we allowed the drug problem to continue, rather than nipping it in the bud and now, it grew to affect the entire country. And violence will affect the entire country, not only the inner cities that currently people look the other way about, unless it is stopped now. And so I just cannot congratulate you enough for your leadership in this whole question of violence as a health problem. And I just uh, say that we will continue to follow your leadership in this very dreadful situation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Right. Thank you very much. Let me thank you to Congressman Stokes for coming and uh, and sharing with us because uh, you've been out there a long time. But uh, I must admit that as bad as things are, I am encouraged in a lot of ways. When I listen to the testimony this morning of Dr. Elders, and now I listen in terms of you and the kind of things that I know that you'd like to see happen, I think that's encouraging. So what we have to do is just to continue to fight and make certain that everybody is aware of this problem. And those statistics that you put out there, I think a lot of folks are not aware of that. And once they see it, they begin to recognize that this is a war and that uh, we need to give the kind of resources to it to make certain that we end this war and uh, we need to end it right away because we're losing too many lives. So thank you very much for your testimony and taking the time to come before the committee this morning. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Payne. Thank you very thank much. You. I would like to uh, call up the panelists uh, from panel one, uh, Dr. Mark Weiss, and the student from the Baltimore City School System, Ralph Green. And from my own congressional district, I'd like to call on uh, Ms. Madeline Daly to please come forward, take a seat at the witness table. Uh, of course, and uh, I understand that Dr. Beverly Jackson has a family emergency while, which will not requ require her to leave. Uh, so what I would like to do is probably ask her to join the panel now. Uh, So we should take a seat at the witness table. Dr. Jackson, I understand you have an emergency, so what I would like to do is to uh, ask you to go first, uh, which would allow the uh, committee an opportunity to <coughs> raise questions with you and also uh, permit you to be able to carry on with your family emergency. We thank you so much for coming this morning. Dr. Jackson. Thank you very much, Chairman Towns, and thank you for arranging, uh, allowing me to testify and uh, make my family emergency. To Chairman Towns, Congressman Payne, members of the Subcommittee on Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations. National Center for Clinical Infant Programs appreciates this opportunity to testify this morning. I also saw the Washington Post headline, Preparing to Die Young. I unfortunately felt that it missed the boat, and what we found in our findings is that it really actually has 
You can ask child care providers and Head Start providers here in Washington about the two, three, and four-year-olds that play drive-by shooting and funerals. And I won't attend your funeral has now replaced you're not invited to my birthday party as the words that hurt four, five, and six-year-olds. Mm. Our very young children have been extremely impacted by the violence in our society. Zero to Three, the National Center for Clinical Infant Programs, is the only national organization that focuses solely on children and family at the various early, very earliest years of life. Everything we've learned about child and family development in the past several decades tells us that what we see in the behavior and emotional adaptation of elementary school children and adolescents can be traced in large part to experiences in the earliest years of life. What these studies, although preliminary, have found is that many of our children are in serious trouble. They've been harmed by violence, whether or not they've been injured by bullets or knives. Our board members have participated in a number of surveys and studies. Barry Zuckerman, chairman of pediatrics at Boston City Hospital, wrote a commentary for the January issue of the Journal of the American Medical Association. He focused on the findings of a studies of children admitted to or examined at Boston City Hospital. These were children under age five, the average age being 2.7 years. 10% had witnessed knife or gun attacks. 19% had witnessed physical abuse, kicking or punching. Half to one third of these incidents were recent and frequent acts. 50% of those children had witnessed acts occurring in the community. 50% had witnessed these acts occurring in the home. Dr. Joy Osofsky at Louisiana State Medical Center uh, conducted a survey similar to the one conducted in Washington, D.C. with elementary school aged children. Over half of the New Orleans fifth graders in her study had been victims of some type of violence. 6% had been victims of severe violence. Over 90% of the children in both studies had witnessed some type of violence. 37% had witnessed severe violence. 40% had seen dead bodies. Over 70% of the children in both studies had witnessed weapons being used. All of these studies reveal a high reported incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder. Of the older children in the study, 40% of the New Orleans children and 15 to 20% of the D.C. children said they worried about being safe, felt jumpy and scared. But that's almost the good side of it. The other side is that when the trauma ceases to be trauma, there's an increased tolerance to violence, almost an immunization against violence. We focus on prevention, and as one of our board members, Dr. Gloria Johnson-Powell, also at Harvard, uh, School of Public Health has said, it's not too late, but it's very late in the game when you focus on a disaffected 15-year-old. You need to look at children when they are initially affected by violence. Our zero to three study group found that violence in its various forms cannot be disentangled. One type of violence cannot be reduced without addressing others. Family violence as exhibited by child and spouse abuse is not a different form of violence from that experienced in society. Family violence and societal violence are all in a similar continuum. They have an impact on each other and frequently affect the same individuals. The attitudes that tolerate and ignore violence in society as a whole also tolerate the violence acted out in individual communities and homes throughout the country. When a child is victimized or witnesses violence, it has a deep, immediate, and perhaps long-term impact. We've learned from the recently released National Institute of Justice report by Kathy Spatz Wisdom, that this, entitled The Cycle of Violence, that early exposure to domestic violence increases the likelihood of arrest as a juvenile by 53%, as an adult by 38%, and an arrest for a violent crime by 38%. At zero to three, we've looked at a number of issues that we believe need to be addressed. One, a family-centered approach to addressing trauma and prevention. Many of the 15 to 18-year-olds that are in the Youth Violence Project also have children. Those children may have been traumatized. They all need to be worked with together. And the services need to not be fragmented toward one group or another, but a full family-centered group of services. We look toward a realignment of values. Violence and violence, violent acts are viewed as entertainment by the society. Everyone in the society has a part to play in our tolerance for violence. When our awareness as a society was, ra was raised about drunk driving, our society began to stop tolerating the um, funny drunk driver or the funny drunk in TV programs. 
When most people began to see smoking as antisocial behavior, uh, then the number of adult smokers began to decline. There needs to be a public health approach, a public health communications as well as health services approach to prevention of violence. Dr. Jim Garbarino uses the car seat example. Twenty years ago, we didn't know about car seats. But now, car seats are provided when children leave hospitals in many cases. Many times, you'll see car adver advertisements talking about built-in car seats. They looked at the whole structure of automobiles and changed it and added a range of things to make uh, cars more uh, safe for children. There has to be a full awareness campaign about violence. And as Congressman uh, town said, violence is not a big city problem. I'm raising children here in Washington, but I can't propose to take my children to Newton, Kansas and find it safer. That's where I'm from, that's where I'm journeying to, because in that town of 16,000, 90% white, there are drive-by shootings. So it's not a racial issue specifically, it's not confined to inner city areas. This is a problem throughout the country. Gang violence occurs in towns with upwards of 20,000 re residents, affecting in people in states traditionally not associated with violence. States as Kansas, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana, not the violence that we're talking about today. Our society has been able to tolerate growing trends in violence with little outcry. In 1991, 1,383 young children, half of them under age one, died from abuse and other intentional injuries. Guns killed 222 children under age 10 in 1990. During the same year, only 68 people of all ages were killed by handguns in Canada, which has similar economic and population patterns. We call upon legislators in all levels of government to do a number of things. First, to address the crippling problem related to indiscriminate gun sales and purchases. Ensure that parents understand their responsibility in gun ownership and keep handguns and other weapons out of the hands of children. Refine the existing fragmented services that are provided for families in the area of prevention. And also, I understand that in the House is going to be introduced a Child and Family Services and Law Enforcement Partnership Bill to match the one in the Senate. We think that that is a very, very encouraging <coughs> outcome. National policies also need to address the amount of violence children can watch on TV and in the movies. According to TV Guide, a violent incident occurs every six minutes on American television. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jackson. What we would do is sort of deviate from the normal pattern here and raise questions with you, and then we'll go back to the regular panel, uh, 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 Congressman Payne. Uh, I have one question f uh, for you. Um, uh, you know, when you talk about um, the fact that young people are saying you're invited to my funeral and not my birthday party, uh, and uh, which I think really points out that this is a public health matter that we must begin to, to deal and have to ch deal with and to begin to turn this matter around. Uh, 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 and we will have to put some resources to be able to do that. Under the health care reform, this is my question, what violence prevention services do we need to direct towards families with infants and, and toddlers, uh, what do we need to do to be able to uh, turn that around? One of the things that we, we need to do was recommended by the Black Caucus of the American Public Health Association, and that is that we begin to look at the fact that children very, very early in life begin to internalize ways of solving problems, internalize the things that they see. For example, a small child that sees violence, the same way that they learn a variety of things. They start with larger movements and then get down to the smaller movements. When they see violence, violence is very global to them and they interpret it very differently than, let's say, a, a teenager who first sees violence. So violence becomes a part of their life, an accepted part of their life. So that when my three-year-old heard that someone who was killed, oh, someone had died at church, his first response was, who shot her? Violence, killing people becomes a natural point of, of, of view for many children. The National, uh, the Black Caucus of the APA suggested the conflict resolution, violence prevention strategies, as well as therapies to work, help children work out violence and the violence they've seen start in the preschool area, not wait till elementary school, but start in the very, very early ages for children. Right. Thank you very, very much. At this time, I yield to my colleague, uh, Congressman Payne from New Jersey. Yes, I, I think that the question that you raised about <clears throat> the trauma 
the little children um, games, but more importantly, the fact that the tolerance level is 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 raising, is rising, and that's the that's the scary part. Uh, I think that uh, there are just uh, it, I th it seems to me that there is a a, a need for people to uh, young people to seek attention, and this becomes very serious because uh, not only with 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 guns, but uh, in our city, in, in Newark, New Jersey, there's a tremendous uh, problem with motor vehicle, with with automobiles being used as a weapon, and uh, in some times there's even uh, occasional riding on a sidewalk with a vehicle or, or a, a vehicle being driven in reverse. Now these are very serious uh, uh, questions because it seems that recognition is being sought and therefore uh, what do you uh, feel about the whole societal situation where large segments of our society feel less than first class by virtue of the kinds of communities and conditions that they have to live in. Do you feel that this is one of the driving uh, factors as relates to this any way to seek recognition? I think seeking recognition is an, as an important element. I, many young people feel that the fastest way to get on TV is through COPS or America's want, Most Wanted. I and mean, that's a very, very direct route uh, or the local programs that, that mimic those. I was part of the alcohol prevention movement in the 80s when the media and the alcohol industry and advocates and a whole range of people were called together and placed in a retreat center and couldn't get out to begin to work out how do you change the way in which alcohol is communicated? How do you not have people come home and immediately get the cocktails on the soap operas? How do you no longer have the funny drunks in the TV programs? After being locked up together for three days, uh, the groups did begin to arrive at things that have resulted now in the alcohol industry advertising about uh, responsible drinking, not drinking as much, teens not drinking, developing contact contracts with teens, and uh, not having everyone that goes out drink together. I think that they've changed the way in the media is, a is doing their thing, changed the way advertising is doing theirs. I think something like that might be helpful in this because it's, a lot of it's communicated. The teens don't, and young people don't get this idea of immediate fame through crime accidentally. That is something that's promoted in our society, in a large part through our media, but also through our uh, tolerance of violence. Thank you. I, I think the point you brought out about the seat, uh, the infant seats, and, and just seat belts in general, and, and smoking, old movies showed a lot of smoke, uh, the, the main character smoking, but today you, you don't see that, so it's just a consciousness level. The other thing that was very sad, uh, last year, the principal from, uh, I think it's Thomas Jefferson uh, High School uh, in New York, uh, testified that, that she attended a, a funeral when she was just uh, a new principal at the school. And when she got to the funeral parlor, she was the only person that was at the funeral other than an organist. And, and so this is almost unbelievable where uh, it's not on a level high enough to even have uh, in some societies the acceptance of it is just becoming outrageous. Um, the question of handguns, do you feel that the, the Brady Bill, which simply gives a seven-day waiting period, is, is, is going far enough, or do you think, in your opinion, that more stringent gun law should be uh, uh, in this country? I would like to see more stringent gun laws. How I, however, I do not want to see young people locked up for carrying guns and then the guns then sold back into the community, back to people who might distribute them. I don't want that to be a criminal offense where they are then, they have a gun, are put into jail for years and years rather than, I'd rather see the educational approach. I want, want to see the guns taken away and out of their hands. But right now we see guns confiscated, and then when there are enough of them, they're sold back to gun dealers. And so there's a continuing cycle of guns re being replenished in our society. 
So I don't want to uh, overly penalize the, the, the teens, although I uh, am very, very fearful of what's, what's going on, but I also realize that many adults are also committing the crime. And so I do, would like to see uh, circumscription or some sort uh, um, tightening of the gun laws, mm -hmm. but not at the expense of, of civil rights. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Payne. And Dr. Jackson, I know you have to uh, depart, so uh, feel free to do so. We thank you so much for your testimony, and uh, we look forward to talking with you further as we try to do something about the problems that we now are confronted with. So thank you very, very much for your testimony. You. At this time, I would like to call on Mr. Green uh, from uh, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, uh, Good morning, Chairman Towns and ladies and gentlemen of the subcommittee. My name is Ralph Green. I live with my family in the Bedford-Stuyvesant area of Brooklyn, New York. I am 16 years old and a junior at Boys and Girls High School. I feel privileged to be able to share with you my feelings on violence as a public health issue and how one violent act has changed my life forever. I hope my testimony helps to bring relief to young people in my community and millions of other people young and old across the nation who cope with violence every day. A year ago, August 13th, I lay on the streets bleeding to death. On that rainy night, a night I will never forget, my friend and I took the bullets in our back from a young man who shot us at random. When we took the bullets, many people felt them. There was nothing good about getting shot, but my friend was more fortunate than me. In less than 30 seconds, my life changed drastically. The bullet from a 38 revolver shattered my pelvis, ricocheted into my intestines, tore away a portion of my colon, burst my bowel and my abdomen, and severed the left branch of my aorta. And that was just the beginning. I lost five liters of blood, more than the body can afford to lose. As I lay on the street, I wanted God to take me. I had no hope that I would see another day. But as you can see, he had other plans. When I arrived at Kings County Hospital, I felt numb. I thought I was paralyzed. The last thing I can recall of that night was my sister holding my hand. When I came out of ICU psychosis, I learned that two months had passed, school had begun, and people across the country knew about me. I also learned that I had survived nine major operations, all averaging 10 hours each or more. At the time, I did not know I had five more to go. Those operations included four amputations, two abdominal surgeries, and four remoldings. At least 10 surgeons under the guidance of Dr. Susan Talbert worked on me day and night. Those doctors had their hands full with other patients from the city war zones. Most of them were gunshot victims. Many of them died. In the hospital bed, I fought another kind of war. My immune system broke down. I was totally dependent for a while on the doctors and on a life support system. But what kept me going was thoughts of my family and football. I did not know my leg had been amputated from the hip until several weeks after my last operation. My mother had the doctors take me off morphine. I had known pain before, but not quite like this. Just to give you an example, the night before a big game two years ago, I accidentally dislocated my finger in practice. I braced myself, and I had my sister pull it straight. I didn't scream because if my mother would have heard me, she wouldn't have let me play. I suffered the pain and eventually went on to score four touchdowns and caught two interceptions. I dealt with the pain because I did not want to miss any opportunities. Football scouts were already coming to watch me play, and I knew that even though I was considered to be good in baseball and, ba and on the basketball court, my victories on the football field would lead me to a college scholarship. I just want you to know what I was about up until the time I got shot. Have I changed since the night of August 13th? Being an independent type, I like to do things for myself. Now I'm forced to slow up. Sometimes I can be impatient. When I'm alone in my room with my trophies and plaques, I have about 45 and posters of my favorite athletes, I look at them and sometimes I wonder, what would have happened to them had a bullet cut them down? And sometimes I ask, why me? I keep, going, I keep going because I don't feel sorry for myself. And even if I wanted to, my friends wouldn't let me. I don't know where I would be without Frank Mickens, the principal of Boys and Girls High School, and Janet Moore, the assistant principal. The Hurricanes football team and all the high school coaches and all the high school football teams throughout New York City. The Jets my friends, my family, and many other people throughout the country are there for me. And I am for myself. I lift weights daily and go to as many games as I can. 
In June, I was involved in the Special Olympics at Hofstra University. I competed in air rifling, disc throwing, volleyball, high jump, shock put, and wheelchair basketball. I jumped five feet without a prosthetic my first time out. I won two golds, a bronze, and one silver. I like winning. I can't accept losing. I don't want anyone's pity. Right now, I practice basketball with special wheelchair handicaps Mondays and Wednesdays at Brooklyn College. Next month, I will be in Florida competing in the Special Olympics again. All of this is good, and it may even ease the guilt from some people that might, that might learn about what I lost. But when there is nothing that I can do, my heart just hurts when I look at people in the NFL running and scoring touchdowns up and down the field. But you know what? I have a lot of obstacles to climb. My first obstacle is that my wheelchair is retired, but so is my jersey number, number nine. I'm glad I did not lose my life. I survived. But we young people everywhere are paying a heavy price to survive. Even the cost of taxpayers is out of control. I realize it's more about doing what's right than it is about money. There's, not, there's no getting around it. Violence costs a lot in dollars and cents in human life. I like to tell you what the incident on August 13th, 1992 costed taxpayers. My care at the hospital costed well over $1 million. Just think, a portion of that could have paid the tuition for future doctors, future teachers, lawyers, congresspersons, and even presidents. Someone I know, a teenager, was shot in the neck and in the mouth the same time I went in the hospital. He is still in the hospital up to this day. I am fortunate. I ask, how many million dollar bullets will it take before someone wakes up? Aren't the gunshots loud enough? Someone said recently, and I quote, a child growing up is, 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 is now exposed to the violence without pain, violence without recriminations, and even violence with humor. When they see this at such an early age, you have a hard time blaming the kids for what has been created as an environment. Everyone knows the guns are, on, are the major cause of a death for a young black person my age. They are, import, they are imported from manufacturers who see them as simply a product. Gun manufacturers say that the Constitution protects them and, and protects their product, but profits are made when people are killed. We all learn in elementary school about life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Do you believe the founding fathers meant for children to lose their lives, liberties, and chances for happiness just because someone wanted to make money? It is up to you, the United States Congress, to tell gun manufacturers they must be responsible to pay for the toll their products are taking on our neighborhoods and our nations. I learned at an early age that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If you want to prevent heart disease, you eat right. If you want to lower your chances of cancer, you don't smoke. If you want to save the future generations of this country, you got to take the guns off the street. This is something you can do. This is something you must do because the future of the nation depends on it. I would like to thank Congressman Ed Towns for inviting me and everyone on the committee for listening to me. I would like to enter this te written testimony into the record. And with your permission, I would like to send other thoughts I may have in the future of this subject to be placed in the records too. If you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. Uh, without objection, your entire statement will be included in the record and we will leave the record open for a number of days to uh, for additional information. Uh, let me uh, thank you uh, very, very much for that moving testimony. Uh, at this time, I will call on Dr. Weiss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Payne, other subcommittee members. Uh, it is a considerable honor to testify before this hearing. I'm Dr. Mark Weiss, a clinical psychologist from the School Mental Health Program of the University of Maryland. We provide therapy services to students in schools in Baltimore, elementary, middle, and high schools. I brought four adolescents with me from one of these high schools, Charte Edwards, Christopher Williams, Trina Myers, and Sean Wallace. After my statement, each of these adolescents will provide a statement, and then we will entertain your questions. An unprecedented level of violence is affecting the physical and mental health of youth in our inner cities. In Chicago, one survey found that 75% of adolescents had witnessed a shooting, stabbing, robbery, or murder. In Washington, a recent survey found that one-third of a group of fifth and sixth graders had witnessed shootings. 
and one-fourth had seen a dead body in their neighborhood. These alarming statistics address only the observation of violence. Many additional children are being victimized. In the survey of youth from this city, one-fourth of the children reported being victims of muggings, and one out of ten reported being victims of shootings. In our work with children in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the city schools of Baltimore, most of the boys have been victims of bankings, during which three to eight boys kick and punch the victim, often inflicting serious injury. Many of the girls have also experienced this form of gang violence. Moreover, up to one-third of the girls we treat have experienced some form of sexual assault. Children and adolescents are affected by violence exposure and victimization in a number of ways. Many show classic symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, such as having vivid memories or images of the violent incident, having nightmares, being hypervigilant and fearful of harm to themselves and others, being unable to sleep, and avoiding people and places that remind them of the trauma. The ability to think clearly and concentrate is often impaired, related to chronic fatigue, nervousness, and intrusive thoughts and images of the trauma. The result is often poor school performance, which leads to negative reactions from teachers and parents, increases feelings of depression, and worsens an already compromised self-concept. Feelings of guilt following exposure to violence are common. Children worry that they should have done something to intervene or should have provided better aid to the victim. Sometimes they wish that they were the victims. Abused children may feel that the abuse was their fault, that they deserved it. Sex sexually abused children often feel damaged and dirty with their sexual identities potentially compromised for their entire life. Some children and adolescents become disconnected from their feelings, going about their daily lives in kind of a fog. Too many have lost hope for their futures and take frequent risks with their lives because they do not expect to live to see age 21. Related to this hopelessness about the future, many urban youth live recklessly for today and unfortunately, growing numbers are being enticed by the fast money and fast life of selling drugs. Central to this lifestyle is the use of weapons, which are easily obtained, increase feelings of power and sometimes self-esteem, and are perceived as necessary for survival. A serious side of the violence problem for urban youth is that many must contend with multiple violent deaths of family members, friends, or acquaintances. For these children, thoughts of the person who has died become traumatic reminders of their violent death, which seriously disrupts the bereavement process. I turn now to what we can do to address the psychological reactions of children and adolescents who have been traumatized by violence. Here, ensuring that these youth have access to mental health services is critically important. One way to increase such access is to provide therapy services in schools. This is a growing movement throughout the nation. In Baltimore, we now have around 30 mental health programs in elementary, middle, and high schools. In our University of Maryland programs, we have found that between 70 and 80 percent of the students we see have had no prior mental health contact. Thus, these school-based mental health services are reaching more youth through the reduction of barriers that typically exist for obtaining such services in the community. Therapy with traumatized youth first focuses on encouraging safety, support, comfort, and rest for the child at home. Youth often feel the need to talk about the trauma, to share details with therapists, family members, and friends, and such open discussion is usually necessary for recovery. After the details of the trauma have been openly discussed, therapists encourage expression of emotions and work to reduce feelings of guilt and self-blame. The child is then assisted in developing coping strategies and in using social supports. 
Other approaches, such as training youth to handle conflict, teaching and reinforcing survival skills, and helping families to problem solve about ways to minimize violence exposure are used by therapists in treating traumatized children and adolescents. I would like to now turn the discussion over to four adolescents who have experienced firsthand the effects of urban violence. Charte, Christopher, Trina, and Sean will each share with you their experiences and thoughts about violence. Charte. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Payne, and other members of the subcommittee. My name is Charte Edwards. I'm 17 years old, and I'm a senior at Southwestern High School in Baltimore, Maryland. I plan to attend Morgan State University and major in child psychology. I have had several experiences with violence. When I was just 10 years old, I saw a man being shot while sitting on my front steps. It was so close that I could actually see the sparks from the gun. At age 12, I watched drug sales from my bedroom window and almost witnessed a murder. In that particular neighborhood, Children couldn't go in their backyards because they were scared of getting caught in a crossfire. This February, nine days after I transferred to Southwestern, I was next to a friend of mine who was shot in her knee while we were returning home from a basketball game. She was just an innocent bystander. A couple of years ago, I myself was involved in a few violent activities. I used to start fights, I carried knives, I cut school or didn't go at all. I started disrespecting my teachers and my parents and most of all myself. And there's a few things that I really wouldn't care to mention. It got so bad that I was scared to come outside because I never knew who was after me. Then one day it hit me that this is not what I wanted for myself. I wasn't ready to die yet and it is exactly what would have happened if I would have continued hanging with the people that I was with. I was shortchanging myself, and I knew it. I decided that I didn't have to be what everyone else in the neighborhood was. I wanted to be different. I wanted to make people proud instead of making people feel ashamed. Now when I see groups of people fighting over territory that they have no claim to, it makes me sad because I know that their lives are going down the same road that I almost took. Everyone won't be as lucky as I was, and it's very sad to say that half of them won't reach their 18th birthday but it's not entirely the fault of the child. Children act on what they see going on around them. I saw violence, so I chose violence as a way of life, and I'm sure that is the case of many other teenagers. I feel that if you better the surroundings of these children, make their communities less violent, and it will cut on most of the violence dealing with young adults. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher? Violence is said to be a thing of a crime of superiority. Many times. Pull, pull the mic in front of you, please. Pull the mic. Thank you. Violence is said to be a crime of superiority. Many times, the thrill of being feared or making people fear you causes violence. Youth carry guns not because there's protection, but because he or she is feared. Greetings. My name is Christopher Williams, and I am one of many who are affected by violence among our youth today. I feel that. More, more youth are into being known for violent acts than acts of good among their peers. For as easily as you walk your female friend to the bus stop, your life can be taken or held up for money and other earthly possessions. I would like to talk to you about some of the things I've seen and experienced. I've seen people commit suicide off of 14-story complexes. I've stood in the line of crossfires. I don't want to die, but it just might happen. I can't control life and death. I'm scared. It scares me to see a friend die, shot for no reason. I try not to worry about it, being shot, killed, but it just might happen. I don't like it, but I must move on. Some people can't do that. They don't have enough willpower to do so. That's why we must help them, because like me, they've seen the actions of the gunman. They've seen friends get shot eight times for, for no reason whatsoever and lose all hope. They've seen people die for no they've seen people die for no reason whatsoever. What can we do to stop the hate in America? We can't take away all the guns, because for every two guns taken off the street, four more are put back on. If people care 
about each other, the violence might decrease in our cities. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Trina? My name is Trina Myers, and I'm a 17-year-old senior at Southwestern Senior High School in Baltimore, Maryland. After graduation, I would like to major in mortuary science. When I was 14 years old, my uncle was shot and killed while I was just two, week, two blocks away from the scene. I saw someone brutally beat with a bat while someone else was stabbed to death as a result of a drug transaction. I have seen countless numbers of drug and gun transactions. I've witnessed many counts of females attacked and physically abused by a male. I don't classify violence as an adolescence issue or a young people issue. I classify it as a society issue. I think society's main problem when it comes to situations that could lead to violence is the lack of communication. What we fail to realize is if we took the same time we spent arguing and fighting and sat down to try to resolve the problem, most of the violent outcomes that we have today would not occur. A lot of neighborhood problems that we have are brought to school, and that involves the rest of the student body and subjects innocent people to danger. Also, parents don't get involved enough with school activities and events. A lot of problems could be resolved a lot easier with the help of our parents. If parents could get their children involved in some kind of extracurricular activity, such as dance, little league, a job, etc., that will cut down on the percentage of children in crossfires, abductions, and neighborhood violence. When children have too much free time, they tend to get into more trouble. If city and state officials see that parents are sincerely involved with the stand against violence in schools and neighborhoods, they too will become more involved and get us more school police and more people to patrol our neighborhoods better to keep it, us, and our children safer. Thank you, Trina. Sean? Hello, my name is Sean Wallace. I'm 17 years old and I'm a senior at Southwestern High School in Baltimore, Maryland. My career goal is to become a Secret Service agent. I have experienced several acts of violence in my mere existence. My most recent experience was just last week when I saw a student hit another student in the head with an acorn while he was exiting the bus. To my surprise, the student that got hit jumped in the bus window and began to hit the student that threw the acorn, savage, began to beat him savagely. Because of the criminal elements that have invaded our society, I have lost several clo close friends and relatives. Drugs and handguns have become a way of life for our youth. My cousin was gunned down by his best friend because he was jealous of a few material possessions that my cousin had acquired honestly. My friend was murdered in a drug-related incident. It was a case of mistaken identity. I think the solution to these problems should start at home. We must start our children out with a strong religious background, teach our children moral values, and beware of the activities that go on in their everyday lives. I think some type of government funding for adolescent uh, a adolescent counseling program would also be a big help. My mother once said she never did anything wrong at home or away from home because she never knew who was watching her. It's time for parents, teachers, community leaders, and officials to start opening their eyes once more. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Payne will now entertain your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weiss and uh, all the participants. Uh, uh, at this time, I'd like to call on Mrs. Daly. Towns, Mr. Payne, and committee members. My name is Madeline Daly. I have been a widow for 10 months, two weeks, and one day. My husband was Patrick F. Daly, the principal of Public School 15 in Brooklyn. He was killed in a course fire of a gang shootout in the Red Hook Housing Project. He was shot in the chest by a fatal bullet. This happened on a Thursday morning on the center mall of the project. This area is the center courtyard of the housing complex. Residents used this mall to walk to and from work, stores, and public school 15. My husband often went into the project to visit families and to escort children home from school. This day, he was looking for a child who left the school building after a fight with another student. He was concerned for the child's safety. This is a day that has changed my life and the lives of my children. My son Patrick and my daughters Mary Elizabeth and Kathleen have been exceptional. They have conducted themselves with dignity all these months and at every function honoring their father. 
They have continued to do well in school. I know their father would have been proud of them. To the outside world, they present themselves very well, but I know they are hurting. What do you tell children who can't understand the terrible pain they feel in their hearts? They have been forced to grow up very quickly. This past Columbus Day was Parents Weekend at my son's college in Albany, New York. Previously, it had been a very special occasion for me. This year, instead of my husband, Pat, my sister accompanied me. While we smiled and tried to be happy, we felt the emptiness and the sadness. As I looked around the campus and saw the other families, I was consumed with grief that our family circle had been so violently broken and our lives so tragically disrupted. For my twin daughters, the celebration of their birthday will always be a reminder of this tragedy. Their father was buried on their birthday. These events and others in my children's lives should have been happy memories. Instead, their hearts are filled with sorrow because of a bullet. There is nothing I can do to ease the ache in their hearts or see the pain in their eyes. As a mother, it is frustrating to know your children are hurting and you can't soothe their pain. For myself, my world has been turned upside down and I don't think it will ever be set right again. My heart is truly broken and overwhelmed with sadness. There is no one to share the accomplishments or problems of family life. I have assumed the tasks of my partner, tasks which were unfamiliar to me. It has been a struggle for me, but somehow I have kept going for the sake of my children. Pat was my husband for 23 years, but more, he was my best friend and companion. We did everything together. Our marriage was an equal partnership, each complementing the other. We shared everything from the major problems of raising a family to the simple joys of taking an evening stroll. Our plan was to raise our children, then enjoy the fruits of our labor while growing old together. Now I have all the responsibility. Nothing is enjoyable, and I will grow old alone. The man I loved and who loved me was cruelly and abruptly taken away. None of us will ever be the same people we were before December 17, 1992. After Pat was murdered, the media carried many accounts of his work in the Red Hook community. The stories barely touched the surface of his extraordinary life. He inspired and encouraged thousands to improve themselves. He directed them onto the right paths. He saved their lives. This I know to be true because of the large numbers of people who came forth with accounts of how Pat had dramatically influenced their lives. I will never forget the children and the adults who came to the funeral home. The faces of the children were filled with pain for the man who had given them hope, who helped them solve their problems and live better lives. Who will help them now? He was always there when they needed him. Patient, kind, diligent in their behalf, understanding and supportive. No one can take his place. No one could give as much to so many. In the 26 years he worked in Red Hook, he never made an enemy. No one has said an unkind word about him. Just think for a moment of the thousands of children who will cross the portals of his school in the years to come. They will never have the benefit of his love and guidance. They will never learn about his quiet strength and devotion to their well-being. Under his guidance, Public School 15 had become a haven a light shining in urban darkness. It is a place where children could feel safe, grow and feel good about the persons they could become. Mr. Daly was there. Everything was going to be all right. I know that he would have continued to work in the community for many years. He loved being at his school and he loved the children. They say from one candle many flames can be made to glow. Pat's flame has gone out and many flames will not glow because he is no longer with us. Almost a year has passed since Pat's death, and we continue to have innocent victims being shot in our cities. This violence must stop. Take away the things that hurt the community, guns, drugs, fear, and overcrowding. On May 27, 1993, Public School 15 was renamed the Patrick F. Daly School in honor of my husband. Create a community just like the Patrick F. Daly School, a haven from harm where help, hope, and love are always offered. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Daly, for your testimony. Uh, 
uh, very moving testimony, and uh, I think that when we listen to uh, all the witnesses, uh, it points out more and more that this is a public health issue and that we must address it uh, as a public health uh, matter. Uh, let me begin, um, Dr. Weiss, by first asking you, uh, do you agree with Dr. Jackson that many of the youth in your program experience violence at such an early age that we are just now seeing evidence of that exposure once they reach high school? Uh, I agree with that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, the effects of trauma can be carried on for years, uh, well into adulthood. And uh, so many of the, the children that have been traumatized early in their lives are still carrying around evidence of that trauma today. Unfortunately, the, the problem seems to be worsening. Uh, so, so the future generation is at particular risk. Um, however, even, even adolescents who've experienced a great level of trauma in their life can still be helped and can still recover from that trauma. Right. What kind of resources uh, has the public school system in Baltimore uh, been able to provide uh, so to support your program? What have they done, basically? Well, it's a resources? cooperative program between the Department of Education and the Department of, of Health uh, in Baltimore City. Um, and the resources have uh, increased in recent years. The program has shown steady growth since its inception. Uh, the mental health programs began back in uh, 1988 uh, with six schools having mental health clinicians. Each year we've added a number of schools and as I mentioned we're now up to around 30 schools uh, and I would expect that we would be expanding the program in the future. Let me just raise one other question with you uh, very quickly. Um, you know, health care reform is a big issue around here now. Everybody's talking about it. And uh, uh, what should we do on the health care reform to support school-based programs like yours? Because we recognize that this is a very serious problem and it must be addressed. I think a number of steps should be taken. Coordination of efforts that are going on across the country would be an initial step. Uh, there are pockets of efforts in various cities where school mental health services are being offered. A, a beginning step would be organization of a conference to get these people together. Beyond that, prioritizing funding for school-based mental health services would be critical. Uh, at present, many of the clinicians operate on their own. They don't have a support team, so to speak. We have submitted proposals to increase staffing in the schools, uh, but they're at only a, the proposal stage. Uh, we, could, we could use clinics in each one of these schools versus a, a single clinician. Um, so prioritizing funding mechanisms to create these programs would be, I think, the most important step. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just sort of raise this with um, uh, uh, the young people there in terms of uh, uh, when we talk about TV violence uh, and of course that's been something that uh, earlier was talked about in reference to uh, Dr. Elders who testified and of course uh, my colleague uh, Congressman Payne raised it and, and, and of course I've talked about it a degree my, to a degree myself. Uh, television violence, do you think that plays a role in terms of people playing out some of these things that are going on? I'd like to hear from the young people. Why don't we start with uh, you, uh, yes, Ms. Myers. It plays an important role. We, um, in our cable television, we have various channels that air videos, music videos, and what we as adolescents fail to do is sit down and actually listen to the music that's being played. And most of our rap songs, which is a big hit with teenagers, you hear all kinds of songs about shooting, stabbing, disrespecting females, anything that has to do with drugs and violence with cars. Um, a lot of our movies that are played today that are promoted by us um, when we go and they're million dollar sellouts with violence and um, a lot of shooting and killing. Most of our cartoons in the morning, such as um, superheroes, 
are loved by children, but they also have a large percentage of violence in it. And I think it's playing a big role because as children, they're seeing this on television and they feel that it's a way of life, that this is the way it's supposed to be. And a lot of parents don't take the time and sit down and talk to their children and tell them this isn't the way that it's supposed to be. Thank you, uh, Ms. Green. Uh, Mr. Green, I want to just sort of raise a question, raise a question with you. You indicated that your medical care costs over a million dollars. Now, when I look at that, and I sort of think about, you know, how much, you know, we could do with that in terms of uh, supporting a program like Dr. Weiss has just talked about and sort of conveying in terms of an early age to young people uh, that violence is not the way to go. So uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, when you talk about that, I think that somewhere along the line that we have to try to get that message across. And I'd like to personally thank you for sort of coming in uh, here again and sort of highlighting it in, uh, in a way that uh, everybody could sort of understand it. So uh, if you were a member of Congress for a day or two days or for a week for forever, what would you recommend that I do? Well. If I was a member of Congress, I would recommend that you try your best to keep the guns off the streets because that's taxpayers' money. It's going into the hospitals and stuff that I named. So the less guns, the less shooters, the less people in the hospital, and that's more money, and New York City won't be in a deficit. Right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Daly, uh, you know, I know of the great work of uh, Mr. Daly and fact that uh, how he's respected in the community and of course and how he and the process of uh, trying to help someone that he lost his life uh, I've heard the stories from the young people in the area talking about all the great things that he's done and uh, uh, for them and the fact that uh, many of them uh, at the college level indicated they would not have made it if it had not been for his support and his encouragement. And uh, I sort of look at, you know, all the kind of positive things that they're saying, and then I look at uh, 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 you in terms of trying to carry on, and, and I think that uh, uh, that's uh, very positive uh, in every sense of the word. What recommendations and suggestions do you have for this committee as to what we might be able to do to prevent situations like this from reoccurring in the future? Perhaps we should start with the very young children and develop a strong self-esteem that they feel good about themselves, that they develop an inner peace within themselves, give them hope that they can become whatever they choose. And then maybe go to the young parents-to-be and tell them and instruct them on how important it is to be a parent, how they have to guide their child. And this child is their responsibility for many years not only when the child is one or two or cute, but as the child gets older and has larger problems. Maybe we need agencies to help young parents to deal with the children as they get older, to guide them and instruct them. The school has to be a haven, like my husband's school, a place where the children want to go, a beautiful place that's well kept and well cared for, and the people at the school care about the children. My husband was instrumental, instrumental in keeping the school open till late at night to have programs for the children, sports programs, homework programs, to keep the children off the streets and away from the drug dealers. All right. Thank you very much. At this time, I would like to uh, yield to my colleague, uh, Congressman Payne. Thank you very much, and thank you, panel. It's a very moving uh, testimony that we've heard here. This morning, and I'd like to once again thank each of you for your participation. Uh, Dr. Wiest, uh, as it was stated earlier, uh, that we as a society seem to be adopting and accepting uh, violence as a form of behavior. Uh, can you describe the psychological implications of the culture of violence on today's youth? Yes, I touched upon some of the aspects of psychological effects of kids that have been traumatized by violence. Uh, a major component is just being traumatized, of living in a state of perpetual anxiety, fearing that violence will happen at any minute to oneself or to a family member or a friend, uh, feeling like there probably will not be a future 
feeling like tomorrow I could die. So there's a very high level of, of nervousness, anxiety, and fear. Uh, there's also a very high level of depression associated with so much loss. So many of the kids that we work with have had multiple deaths uh, occur in their, uh, by family and friends by violent means. The problem is, is often one of you can't recover when things continue to happen. Uh, when you've been traumatized and there continue to be small traumas in your life, when, when there's a rumor that there's a child in school that has a weapon, when three boys threaten to beat you up, when somebody pushes you in the hallway, uh, when your mother gets stuck up on the way home from work, it really impedes recovery from trauma. That's such a significant issue for many of these kids is that when they begin to recover from some violent incident, other things happen that set them back. And I think it, it contributes to this sense of futurelessness. I don't have a future. Why should I invest in society when I'm not going to be able to contribute to society? And I guess following that, then you feel that that certainly would have an impact on a student's interest, for example, in education, their, uh, uh, their concern about um, when they get grown and get to buy a house or have children, but that they perhaps tend to live for, for today because tomorrow may not come, and therefore careless behavior, whether it's sex, whether it's violence on someone else, whether it's uh, taking the deer, as I indicated, some youngsters decided to see who can drive cars backwards faster through even intersections against the light. I mean, this is certainly, mm -hmm. I guess, symptomatic of the fact mm -hmm. that I, I may not be here. Let me just have some thrills, or would you concur with that? Yes, I would. It's very hard to see a, a, a future life of comfort and safety that, that many of us have, have experienced. And, and much more salient for these kids are the drug dealers driving around in their Lexus cars and uh, their legends and having lots of money and appearing to have something going for them. Um, so the lure of that, I think, is increased when you're so fearful for your own safety and, and, and are very pessimistic about your own future. Okay. Finally, I've introduced uh, legislation. I'm a member of the Education Labor Committee. Uh, which is an elementary school counseling act where we're attempting to have funded some demonstration projects around the country where in elementary school counseling would be there and uh, just because of the trauma and the situation like that. Do you think that uh, uh, that type of legislation would be very important? I think that would be critical. Uh, I think those school-based services are very important at all levels. Um, I think the case can be made that we begin at the early levels to try to prevent some of the outcomes of violence, trying to prevent kids from becoming violent uh, or becoming so traumatized that it's hard for them to recover. But I do also believe that we should have those services at all levels, elementary, middle, and in, in high schools. Just finally, really finally, um, in our city, we recently, I'm a former member of the Municipal Council before coming to Congress, and our city council on the leadership of of Council President Harris just recently passed an ordinance banning the sale of, of um, t-shirts in our city. There were t-shirts being sold with profanity, with uh, degrading of women, and they're just being sold up and down the street. Do you feel that there is a lack of responsibility on the part of commercial people in addition to the television violence and movie violence? but? for a, a, a manufacturer to manufacture and for a, a peddler to sell these kinds of things. Of course, there's going to be a question about the constitutionality of First Amendment, but I commend the Municipal Council in Newark for passing an ordinance and just taking it to the courts. Do you feel that also has a, a, a negative impact on our students? I agree. I think that anything that glamorizes violence or says that it's okay to put others down uh, is a stimulus that could provoke violence. Uh, and I would support efforts to, to uh, eliminate those stimuli. I know in Baltimore City now we have efforts underway to uh, 
take down billboards that promote uh, alcohol use in the inner city. And uh, I think those efforts are, are needed uh, uh, as part of a comprehensive plan to begin to address this problem. Okay. Let me just conclude by, uh, uh, try to conclude by asking the young people, uh, for the past three years during the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, last four years, actually, I have had a, a brain trust. I head up the Youth Brain Trust. And last year, the brain trust was called Reaching the Hip Hop Generation. We discussed uh, ways to try to communicate with young people because we were trying to figure out how we can get a message uh, to young people and to, to try to listen to them. Uh, we know that just saying don't do something is not enough. But um, I, I want to pose a question to each one of you. Uh, how can we get today's youth, in your opinion, to understand uh, that violence is harmful, that drugs are harmful? Uh, up to now, evidently, we've been unable to communicate properly. Do you think that we're using the wrong type of media, the wrong PR consultants? I'd like to hear how you would do it if you had an opportunity. Okay, Mr. Green. Use this. I think that you should try different things besides songs. Because if a kid in the streets of Brooklyn where I'm at hear a song about school and stuff, they don't want to hear that. I think it should be like basketball tournaments where it's pe a lot of people will be involved, boys and girls. That's what I think it should be. Like mm -hmm. tournaments and like stuff, centers and stuff. It's our community centers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The average kid out there don't, um, don't want to hear a song about education and stuff like that. All right. Any of the others would, any suggestions on how you would try to communicate to your, your peers, your school classmates, if you had a chance to do that? Another way to do it would also be to uh, show them the, the other side of violence, the results of violence, and make statistics avail more available to, to the people our age so they can see what's going on, and show them that it's not so glamorous. And then, on the other hand, present things as glamorous. I mean, show them another way to have glamorous things without going through violence or illegal activities. Okay. Thank you. Any others? Me to um, show the youth of the day that they can be, they can get to the top without having to sell drugs and be rich without having to do all the stuff that they, people do on the streets. They can, we need to make it so they have fun while they do it. Because it's like people, children that see violence tend to be more violent. But if, if you keep them like playing football games and playing basketball, baseball, and stuff, then it, it tend not to be, they tend not to be that violent. They tend to care about sports and academic stuff, because you need academics to stay in sports. That way they go to, to college and make some of their lives. Okay. Thank you. Also, I feel that if you had more positive role models in their communities, and they were supporting the, um, for them to better themselves instead of resorting to violence, then it also help them to get the point that violence is not the answer. And also community functions, because people are not coming together. It's, people feel that if it's not particularly, you know, pertaining to them at that point, that they don't want to be involved. If they can come together, then maybe they can help stop what's going on. Let me just ask you, is that what happened to you? You said you were doing the wrong thing, you didn't care, but then one day you decided to change. Could, is, would you be able to tell us why, unless it's too personal? First of all, I think it's because I changed over. I started going to church, giving time to God, and realizing that the things that I was doing wasn't going to better me. It was only going to make the things worse. And that's basically it. Thank you. Just finally, I'd just like to say to Ms. Daly, I really appreciate your you're coming and testifying, as the chairman said, and uh, I do feel that the death of your husband will not be in vain. I think that people around the country, um, attention was drawn to the fact that this violence 
is out of control. I think it was happening all around and there was no real focus on it, but this tended to put a focus on the question of violence in our society. And, uh, and, and now I, I hope that we can come up with, with some solutions. Thank you. Let me, thank you very much, uh, Congressman Payne. Let me uh, also uh, indicate the fact that I appreciate all of you coming and uh, sharing your experiences with us. And of course, uh, uh, I think that one thing that you've clearly pointed out that uh, a positive involvement will make a difference. And I really feel that uh, we need to focus on that and to try to find the resources to encourage young people to get involved in a very positive way. Uh, and uh, I think that if we're going to talk about uh, health care reform, that somewhere along the line that we have to think in, about finding some money to put in there to make certain that we're able to give young people that kind of positive kind of involvement and that kind of direction. I noticed that you indicated in terms of athletic involvement, I think that uh, uh, probably debating teams, all kinds of things that wherein you find something at some level that a young person can do and be able to do it effectively. So let me thank all of you again for sharing those experiences with us. I think it will mean a great deal as we begin to deliberate in terms of our health care package and all the other things that we might do here in the Congress. So thank you, uh, Mr. Wallace, Ms. Myers, Ms. Daly, Mr. Green, and of course, Ms. Edwards, and of course, Mr. Weiss, and uh, also uh, uh, in the middle there, I can't quite see your name, but uh, I also appreciate uh, your testimony as well. Uh, thank you very, very, very much. Thank you. Now we'll hear from our second panel, Dr. Kellerman from Emory University, who has just completed a major study on violence in America, and Dr. Stanton from the University of Maryland, who has also done research on youth violence in urban areas. Uh, if you would take your seats. Let me thank both of you for uh, coming to uh, testify. And why don't we begin with you, Dr. Stanton. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Dr. Benita Let Stanton. Me, just a moment. Let me see if we can adjust the microphone. Thank you. I'm Dr. Benita Stanton, Professor of Pediatrics and Director of the Center for Minority Health Research at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. I appear this afternoon on behalf of the Association of American Medical Colleges, which speaks for the 126 United States medical schools. As a result of decades of research and experience, U.S. health care providers possess a wide range of life-saving technical skills to offer victims of violence. As physicians, many of us are highly skilled in effective treatments to repair the acute physical effects of violence, such as setting bones and suturing lacerations. However, both as health care providers and as educators, we have another series of important missions. We know that victims of violence and their families have a strong likelihood of future victimization by violence. And as we've heard all morning, that the untold consequences of the Violent Act may go on for years. Medical school faculty must train medical students to be effective, not only in treating the immediate physical effects of violent behavior, but also in treating the long-term rehabilitative and preventive needs of these patients in order to address the broader public health issues of violence. Three main factors are involved in accomplishing this expanded teaching mission. First, we must sensitize medical and other health professional students to a broader professional obligation to victims and perpetrators of violence. Second, students must recognize and respect the sociocultural diversity that can be associated with violence. Third, students must know what support services should be available to both victims and perpetrators of violence. Traditional medical school curriculum provide an excellent biomedical basis for addressing the acute injuries resulting from trauma. 
of equal importance, but until recent years receiving much less emphasis in medical schools, is the training of students to address health issues beyond the direct and immediate physical concerns of the patient. Recently, many medical schools have begun to implement programs which orient students towards this second broader obligation that they must address as physicians. For example, most medical schools have incorporated educational experiences in violence-related health issues such as substance abuse, domestic violence, etc. These curricular changes require funding both for their development and implementation and also for evaluation in order to monitor their effectiveness. The second impediment to effective intervention in assisting victims of violence relates to sociocultural barriers that all too frequently exist between physicians and victims of violence. These differences in cultural and economic backgrounds minimize the likelihood that without appropriate training and experience, physicians will be skilled in detecting high-risk patients, in treating them effectively, and enrolling them in appropriate services. Historically, issues in cultural diversity have received minimal attention in the curriculum. However, the situation has begun to change. Much of the research undertaken by my colleagues and me is directed at this issue. Other campuses are beginning to adapt curriculum based on existing models of cultural diversity to address their local needs. Finally, the third factor necessary to enable medical students and physicians to address the broader issue of violence is sufficient support services for victims and perpetrators of violence. A lack of service options is a problem in itself, but also creates a larger systemic problem. As physicians, we learn with time what questions not to ask our patients. If we cannot address a problem, we learn how to shield ourselves from seeing that problem and how to subtly guide our patients to cover that problem from us. This training is not any part of an explicit uh, curriculum, but results from a paucity of adequate referral and support services in our communities. Instead, one of our goals as educators should be to make our students patient advocates in general, including becoming advocates for community services directed at the long-term solutions, such as many of the suggestions we've been hearing all morning. What kind of services are we discussing? For the adolescent age group, services should include first-time offender jobs training options, alternative educational options, and employment and placement support. Included in these programs, which address the economic and educational sources of violence, should be training and decision making and interpersonal negotiation. Radical expansion of these programs, which have been shown to work, and greater analysis of their health impact to guide their further development is e urgently needed. Physicians must be trained about these treatment options and must learn that placement of their patients in appropriate programs is as essential to the practice of good medical care as is the performance of any required biotechnical procedure. The federal government and academic medical centers have an opportunity and an obligation to significantly alter the role that violence is currently playing in our society. We must assure that adequate treatment services are available in communities to enable our graduates to provide high quality health care and to serve as patient advocates. We must teach them that patient advocacy is an essential role of the physician and society must learn to value this role of the physician. In addition, service and research funds directed at violence treatment and prevention should be linked. In this way we can build upon what we already know, expand our knowledge base of what works, and begin to identify the relative value of various program options. Thank you very much for this opportunity to testify today, and I'd be happy to answer questions or expand. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stanton. Uh, Dr. Kellerman. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> my name is Arthur Kellerman, and I'm an emergency physician. My colleagues and I serve on the front lines of America's health care system. As providers of emergency and trauma care, we see the consequences of violence 24 hours a day, seven days a week. My desire to work harder to prevent the consequences of violence led me to resign my position as director of the emergency department at the Regional Medical Center at Memphis in order to move to Atlanta to direct the Center for Injury Control at Emory University. <clears throat> Although I continue to practice emergency medicine, my colleagues at the American College of Emergency Physicians and I 
are determined to do more than simply react to violence and its consequences. Injuries, particularly injuries due to violence, have long been considered an inevitable consequence of living in a modern society. We now know that injuries disproportionately affect high-risk groups, follow an often predictable chain of events, and are therefore preventable. The dramatic gains we've made in the prevention of motor vehicle-related trauma is a case in point. For decades, the federal government spent untold millions of dollars trying to fix the nut behind the wheel. It was not until we shifted our focus to building safer cars and better highways that our horrendous death rate due to car crashes began to fall. As a result of these efforts, the toll of death and disability per vehicle mile traveled today is less than half what it once was. Now, guns are second only to motor vehicles as a cause of fatal injury in the United States. Ironically, as we succeed in our efforts to control many motor vehicle-related deaths and ignore gun-related violence, there are signs that this relationship may change. In at least two states, Texas and Louisiana, firearms have already overtaken motor vehicles as the leading cause of fatal injury. The rest of the nation is not far behind. Firearm-related fatalities are usually buried in state and national statistics on suicide, homicide, and unintentional deaths. When they're grouped together, guns emerge as the eighth leading cause of death in the United States and the second leading cause of death among Americans aged 15 to 34. During the decade of the 80s, guns killed more than three times as many Americans as the AIDS virus and more than five times the number of Americans who died during the entire history of our military involvement in Vietnam. Now, you've heard from previous witnesses estimates that guns in this country cost society 16 to 20 billion dollars a year in medical care costs, disability, and premature death. We may not be sure exactly how much guns cost society, but we've got a pretty good idea who's picking up the bill. Private insurance and other sources of reimbursement pay for less than 15 percent of the costs of medical care. The rest is covered by public funds or written off. Now, violence is having a major impact on our nation's trauma and emergency care system. The high cost of treating victims of violence has forced scores of trauma centers to close. In cities like Atlanta, Miami, and Los Angeles, public hospitals are all that stand between the community and a complete collapse in trauma care. Violence is also eroding the social fabric that binds our society together. The shooting of three emergency physicians in a Los Angeles hospital earlier this year shattered the illusion that many health care workers held that we were immune. Emergency departments were once considered a haven from the dangers of the street. Now we know that violence can be transported as easily as a small caliber handgun. It can strike in our homes, our schools, our courthouses, and even our hospitals. Although these statistics are disturbing, they cannot convey the devastating emotional impact of gun-related death. When an innocent child is cut down in crossfire, a teenager ends his life with his father's gun, a man is shot in a trivial dispute, their lives and the lives of everyone in their family and their neighborhood are changed forever. The police are doing everything they can, but they can't do it alone. Many deaths and injuries due to violence can be prevented. There are reasons to believe, however, that progress will be difficult to achieve. First, the resources presently committed to violence research are totally inadequate to meet the task. The National Research Council recently reported the federal government spent only $20 million on violence research in 1989. This investment, an average of $3.41 per violent incident, pales in comparison to the cost of these events. $54,000 per rate, $19,200 per robbery, and $16,500 per aggravated assault. Second, we presently lack the capacity to monitor violence as a public health problem. Development of a firearm fatality reporting system and minor, minor modifications to the National Crime Survey, the National Health Interview Survey, and the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System could dramatically enhance our ability to document the magnitude and extent of firearm violence and assess the effectiveness of violence prevention programs. 
The support for these measures must come from you and your fellow members of Congress. Third, we must resist the temptation to single out a particular group, such as teenagers, or a particular problem or strategy as our sole response to violence. Line item appropriations or categorical programs are a poor substitute for a broad-based research program that seeks to understand all of the individual, family, and societal forces that influence violence. Many factors promote violent behavior or worsen its consequences. We need to more clearly understand the role of poverty, illegal drugs, racism, unemployment, child abuse, the media, and the marketing of guns. Rather than be overwhelmed by the weight of these problems, we should view each of them as an opportunity to make a difference. We must be open to any idea, any strategy that might work. It will be equally important, however, to subject each of these promising ideas to rigorous evaluation. It's not enough for us to run out and do something about violence. We must invest the time and sufficient resources to determine if our efforts are doing any good. Now, the challenges are great, but there is cause for hope. We can all remember when the automobile industry fought efforts to improve the safety of motor vehicles because it would cost too much. Now, safety sells, and the nation saves billions of dollars each year from crash-related deaths and injuries that didn't happen. The gun industry is not likely to be any more receptive to a broadening of our focus from the hand behind the gun to the gun itself, but this change is also overdue. Modifications to the design of firearms to make them less destructive and much less prone to unintentional discharge or criminal misuse can be done and should be done now. A generation ago, Hollywood glamorized cigarettes, and more than half of all Americans smoked. After research demonstrated a link between cigarette smoking and an increased risk of heart disease, emphysema, and lung cancer, public attitudes about smoking began to change. Today, far fewer people choose to smoke, and our rate of cigarette-related heart disease has substantially declined. Perhaps, perhaps, a generation hence, our children may look back at a time when Hollywood glamorized gun violence and half of all homes in America contained one or more firearms. Research has recently demonstrated a strong link between gun ownership and an increased risk of homicide, suicide, and unintentional gunshot deaths. And public attitudes about handguns are beginning to change. Perhaps someday far fewer people will choose to own guns and our death rate due to firearms will substantially decline. In closing, I want to remind you that although violence is an enormous public health problem, it's only one piece of the $180 billion pie that represents the cost of injury in the United States. The Clinton administration's proposal for health care reform has identified disease prevention and primary care as cornerstones of its program to control costs. I would argue that a comparable investment in injury prevention and emergency care could save billions of dollars and tens of thousands of lives each year. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Let me thank both of you for your testimony, Dr. Stanton, and also you, Dr. Kellerman. Um, let me open by saying hopefully uh, 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 we'll have an opportunity to pass the Brady Bill uh, before we recess this year. Uh, what other actions should we take as members of Congress uh, to try to reduce the incident of violence? Injury control experts usually outline three main strategies for dealing with an injury problem. We call them the three E's, education, enforcement, and engineering. We've heard a great deal about education today, as we should. We need to educate health care providers to more accurately recognize and intervene with victims of violence at an early point in the cycle of recurrent victimization. But we also need to educate our citizens about the true balance, for example, of benefits and risks associated with owning guns. In this room, we're in a gun-free zone. People argue in this society that guns are not part of the problem, they're part of the solution. I'm not sure very many people in this room would feel safer if they had a gun in their pocket and knew that half the people in this room were carrying a firearm. 
I think we feel safe because we know, having gone through metal detectors to come in here, that there are no guns in this room. Yet we expect that people in society are supposed to feel comfortable by having a gun in their pocket and half of our homes contain firearms. It's a false illusion and we need to educate the public through science and through the media and through our words and actions that having a gun is false security. The kids who testified today, the family members who testified today are compelling evidence that that's far from the truth. Second, in the case of enforcement, we clearly need to do a better job of enforcing laws that are already on the books, particularly those to help keep guns from getting into the hands of kids. The young people who testified on the panel before this one, not one of them owns a gun factory. Not one of them is a federally licensed gun dealer. Not one of them owns a major movie or television studio. They're not the perpetrators of the problems that we're dealing with in society. They're also the victims. We need to more broaden the net of accountability so that manufacturers, licensed gun dealers, and purchasers need to pay a higher share of taxes, need to pay stiffer licensing <coughs> fees, and need to bear a fair share of the cost of gun violence in society. The Brady Bill is a terribly important start, but I don't think it will be enough. I think we have to ban assault weapons. I think we have to take a tough look at handguns. And I think that we have to be willing to look at effective strategic use of taxation and other strategies to decrease demand for weapons and generate needed money to offset the cost of gun violence. Finally, I don't think we should overlook the value of engineering. They're marketing handguns today like the ladysmith to women as something that they need for self-protection. Many of the handguns being sold to women don't even include a safety to make that gun childproof. I think that's outrageous. And I think any manufacturer that makes a firearm that's not purposefully engineered so that it's difficult or impossible to be fired by a small child should be held accountable for that design oversight. If we can put a man on the moon, we can sure as hell invent a single user specific gun or a gun that can't be easily discharged by a small child or someone that grabs it in a moment of anger. We're smart. We're the best engineers in the world. If we can't figure out how to do that, we're pretty pitiful. Why has our industry overlooked these options? Again, we should leave no stone unturned, no option untried. Evaluate them for effectiveness and do whatever it takes to make a difference in this enormous problem. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kellerman. Uh, Dr. Stanton, um, there's been a lot of discussion about ma mandating that medical schools include some instruction about how to deal with victims of domestic violence in the curriculum, which is and, uh, fine. Do you think that this kind of instruction should be expanded to cover violence generally? I think that's an excellent question, and I think it's long overdue. I, I think that the uh, increased focus in recent years on domestic violence, particularly child abuse, but the broader issue of domestic violence has seen a substantial change that has been documented in some, quite a few studies now of medical students and of young physicians that we all recognize that the, much of the increase that we're seeing in child abuse probably reflects an increased sensitization of doctors who are aware that the problem is there and that there are treatment options for these children and it's probably due to curricular changes that made them comfortable and able to actually detect it. We've seen some changes in adult-adult um, domestic violence but because there have been so few programs yet addressing the issue of non-domestic non violence in the medical school, we haven't seen corresponding changes yet. So I think your suggestion is excellent. Thank you very much. Let me ask, I guess, both of you um, this particular question. Uh, what can we do in the health care reform to support violence prevention activities? You know, uh, we are moving here again with this whole health care reform package. and. Uh, I don't think there's enough emphasis, enough uh, uh, being put on uh, the whole prevention of, of violence. Uh, what can we do to maybe to uh, uh, create the kind of uh, protection that needs to be there? I'll start. Uh, I think one of the most exciting things about the health care reform is its emphasis on primary health care and prevention. And as Dr. Kellerman and really everyone this morning has alluded to, if there's one area of health need that is going to be responsive to uh, a primary health care and prevention approach, it's violence. 
I think that the orientation of the physician out of the medical setting and into the community will be essential. And likewise, just as the medical student and the doctor has to move out into the community, into many of the uh, prevention programs that are community-based, I think that these same community-based programs have to learn to invite us in there and to insist that we be there. Partnerships that are developing, for example, in Baltimore, there's several that are developing between the medical school and the public housing developments, uh, between the medical school and the uh, local schools. These are the kinds of examples of primary health care with a focus on violence prevention that will be essential, I think, to the health care reform move. This is what primary health care should be. Secondly, I think we need to look to some of the activities that are resulting in the increase of violence. I think there's little question that the actual deaths that are occurring as a result of violence are attached to the increase in the number of guns. But we're also seeing a huge increase in violence in general that isn't necessarily resulting in deaths. Uh, we've become concerned because first, as we began to conduct ethnographic studies, with community members, both parents and children, and they increasingly were pointing towards drug trafficking. And then when we began to do epidemiologic analysis of particularly homicides, but also non-homicidal trauma, we realized that so much of the serious violence is occurring in the context of drug trafficking, and for a whole variety of legal reasons, primarily, drug trafficking is increasingly involving younger and younger children. It's not at all uncommon, as we all know now, to have children picked up who are 8, 9, 10, 11 years. So at the same time that we have a broad-based approach, i.e. primary health care, moving out into the community, uh, that we have specific content approach, i.e. the gun control legislature, I think we also have to start looking at some of the big areas of behavior that are also contributing to the, the worst tolls in violence. I think in very practical terms, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We need to do a better job of maintaining the wheels we've already got to roll down the road. The National Center for Injury Control currently only receives about $39 million in their total budget for all injury problems, including violence. That's a pitiful amount when you consider that injuries are the leading cause of health care costs for Americans between the age of 5 and 50. They have developed a mechanism both for funding direct research funding and evaluating pilot programs, and building the capacity of local and state health departments to make a big difference not only on violence but a variety of injury issues. The National Institute of Justice has a superb intervention and evaluation program to look not only at standard criminal justice approaches but preventive approaches as well. I think we need to take, Congress needs to take a leadership role and put more dollars into prevention-oriented programs and demand that those programs include allocated resources to evaluate the impact of the efforts. I think what we've got to really be careful about right now is that this is such a pressing problem that we're going to run out and throw things on the street and not really know if they're making an impact so that evaluation is going to be terribly important. But if, if Congress will get in front on this issue, this isn't just a matter of doing good and making people feel better. This is smart money because a dollar that we spend today to limit or prevent the consequences of violence will pay back five, ten, fifteen dollars later in decreased health bills, decreased societal costs, and a more productive, healthier, secure workforce for society in the next generation. It's a smart investment. Thank you. Let me uh, raise one other question with you. Um, you sort of alluded to it. Uh, what specific uh, changes would you recommend in our fatality reporting system? What would you recommend that we do there? Uh, a couple of things. There was actually an article in the Journal of American Medical Association that advocated the creation of a firearm fatality reporting system. Currently, we have a system for fatal car crashes called the Fatal Accident Reporting System that really has led to a lot of the landmark work in motor vehicle safety. A comparable surveillance system could be created for every gun fatality in this country that would yield us a very rich database on the incident, the circumstances, the individuals involved, what kind of gun was involved, where it came from. That could be done for about two and a half million dollars, about what Congress authorized this year for the civilian marksmanship program 
uh, and with help, and you know, and, and supported again last week. For the same amount of money, we could fund this system. The three surveys that I described are already funded. They already exist. All we've got to do are tinker with the questions. That can be done for virtually nothing. The National Health Interview Survey, for example, asks a large sample of Americans every year. When were they sick? When were they hurt? How did they use health care? How they're functioning? It gives us a snapshot of the health of the American public. Not one gun-related question has been included on any annual edition of the National Health Interview Survey since 1972. Was that an oversight or was that conscious? I don't know. But that can be changed at virtually no cost at all just by rewriting next year's questionnaire. So we could gain a wealth of information at very little cost and then we can know where to go. It's hard to drive down the road when the windshield's painted over. We need information to be able to make sound public policy decisions. Uh, in addition to that, I'd like to point out that although there are now many national drug surveys, some of which are targeting the adult population and many of which are targeting adolescents, on these national questionnaires, there are no questions about drug trafficking. We now know that the prevalence of drug trafficking is probably greater, and certainly in the areas where there have been spot studies, than substance abuse in early adolescents. We also are beginning to get data to suggest that the consequences in terms of violence and homicide are far greater. And the flip side of that is uh, there have been some very nice work done in New York to suggest that if we looked at the actual causes of homicide, if we made that part of standard reporting, we again would begin to get a very different picture of what's, what the background to the homicides are. That for years we've been struggling with questions, you know, the question for example of uh, is it due to drugs? Is it, is it due to uh, being inebriated, et cetera? In fact, we have very little data that's built into the standard data collecting systems that lets us get at this fundamental question. Thank you very much. Let me raise this in a, uh, and to say in advance, I realize you're not a psychiatrist, I realize you're not a lawyer, and I realize you're not a judge, but your background is so extensive, I feel very comfortable raising this with you, and I would like to hear, hear you on this point. Uh, will it help to reduce gun violence if we make it a federal offense for anyone under the age of 18 to possess a handgun? Or will it provide just another means to bring minority youth into the criminal justice system? I'd like to hear both of you on that issue. I suspect the latter would be far more the case than the former. Um, again, a fundamental principle of public health is to go after a problem at the point source. For us to try to somehow, through passage of a law, interdict or interrupt the flow of guns into the hands of teenagers on the street level, we're kidding ourselves. All we're going to do is put more kids in jail and more kids out of college. What we have to do is start moving our focus back to the store and back to the loading dock. And if we take a look at what weapons are out there, which weapons are disproportionately involved in violence, how we are screening the purchasers of guns, whether a felony is the adequate criteria or whether any past violent crime should disqualify a gun purchaser and start looking further back in the point source. Point source, the manufacture, the design, the wholesaling and retailing of guns, that's where we can make a difference. That's a legal structure, one that's very amenable to regulation. They're not going to like it. But we can do it a heck of a lot more effectively there than blaming the 16 or 17 year old who wants a gun because he's scared or she's scared and they bought into the lie that you're safer with a gun than without one. And I think the kinds of victim stories we've heard indicate that's anything but the truth. Thank you. I think it's a very interesting question. Unfortunately, I, I think that I have to agree that that would probably be the consequence. Um, we've seen so many other examples where minority, particularly urban and especially males, are taking far more than their share of blame for actions that lots more people are um, involved in. It, for example, in Baltimore, over 92 percent of all drug dealing arrests are of minority uh, use. We know that they're not the only ones. In fact, they're not the ones that are probably reaping the highest percent of the benefits from whatever drug trading is going on. Uh, so while it might have an immediate impact making us feel a bit better, there might be members of society that feel better, 
I think it basically would be once again hitting that group of people who are already most victimized by violence. Thank you. Kids aren't dumb. They're going to do what they think is in their best interest, just like we do. I think what, what we have to do and what we've learned today are we have to give young people positive alternatives, something better than picking up a gun and robbing a store or knocking somebody off on the street or getting in a fight after school. We've got to give them positive alternatives, and the threat of a felony conviction in jail uh, is not a positive alternative. I think we have to really take a much more long-term view, start with them young, work with them, give them a better choice than the choice they've got today. All right. Let me thank both of you. And then my final question, um, I think it was uh, you, Dr. Kellerman. Uh, you indicated that we only spent $20 million on violence in terms of research in 1989, I think you indicated. Uh, first, do you know what the research involved and what do you believe our research priorities should be in this area? First of all, I just find that to be a little strange, $20 million. That's the best guess. I actually was a member of the National Research Council panel on the understanding control of violent behavior that was charged with reviewing the full array of research that's been conducted on violence over the past 10 or 15 years. And I represented medicine and public health on that panel. That's the best we could come up with. And I don't think there's been a real change in the last couple of years since that report was issued. That report outlines a number of strategies, as does the Centers for Disease Control report on Healthy People 2000, gives very good guideposts for where we need to go. That research funded a variety of, of studies from behavioral individual correlates of violent behavior, some longitudinal work to look at how kids turn out to be violent when they get older or nonviolent as they get older, and a few studies that looked at the relationship between gun availability and violent outcomes. But 20 million doesn't go very far when you consider the normity of the problem and the issues that we're having to confront. I think we have to, again, look at a comprehensive long-term strategy that includes both basic research on behavior and applied research on intervention programs, education, enforcement, and engineering that can make an impact on violence and evaluate those rigorously, and then we're going to get somewhere. It's not going to happen in a year or two, but in five or 10 or 15 years, we can have a quite safer and more secure society than we have today if we're willing to make that investment. Yeah, you know, used to 20 million, I tell you, Doc, it doesn't seem to be a serious commitment to the problem when you have the magnitude of the problem that we just discussed here this morning, where uh, you, one youngster just indicated in terms of his case, in terms of how much was spent, you know, uh, in the ho in hospital bills, over a million dollars. This is a very serious matter, and it seemed to me that uh, a lot more should be allocated for, to see if we can come up with some answers. Uh, this is destroying families. As I listened to uh, Mrs. Daly, who uh, indicated the fact that uh, her husband, and what that had done to her family, here is a man providing services to a community, uh, was, was killed going out looking for a student who had left the school uh, to try to bring the, the, the youngster back to the school, and uh, which showed his commitment. But at the same time, his life was uh, it ended, and now the frustration and the turmoil and all the problems that's created for that family. And, uh, I, and I just think that when we look at it, I think that uh, we need to make a more serious effort at getting some answers. And $20 million, uh, to me, uh, uh, is not a whole lot of money when we have a problem that we have today. I mean, I just don't see in terms of, uh, I think that uh, uh, $20 million uh, uh, does not show any real commitment on our part. I couldn't agree with you more. But again, I think it's very important for Congress, the administration, and the American public to realize money spent on violence prevention is a smart investment. This is not another issue where let's just get, be the federal government and throw a bunch of dollars at something. We'll get very big financial paybacks in decreased costs at a federal, a state, a local, and an individual level if we begin to invest in violence prevention today. It's way overdue, but there's no better time to start than now. Well, let me thank both of you for your testimony. Let me thank you for the kind of work that you're doing. Uh, uh, and I just say to you that uh, I think your coming here today uh, means a great deal to a lot of people because, as I indicated early on, that your entire statement will be included in the record, of course. Uh, and uh, as people begin to look at this, I think that maybe we can make the case 
uh, that we need to change some things and that our priorities are upside down uh, because we're talking about lives and that's something that uh, is very, very important. And I think that we need to get that message across and thank you for coming and helping us to do so. Thank you very much. Our final um, panel represents health care providers who treat the victims of violence on a daily basis. I would like to ask Ms. Whitesell, Mr. Ali, who is from a hospital in my district, and Dr. Wright and Mr. Lopez to come to the witness table. Ms. Whitesell, why don't you begin? Mr. Chairman, thank you for inviting me to speak at this important issue. My name is Karen Whitesell, and I'm a physical therapist at National Rehabilitation Hospital here in D.C. I'm here on behalf of the American Physical Therapy Association, which represents 59,000 healthcare professionals who evaluate and treat neurological and musculoskeletal dysfunction. I've spent the last nine years of my practice working with victims of violent crimes, and specifically gunshot wounds. Most people, including urban youth, think that one either dies or recovers completely from gunshot wounds. On the contrary, for every one homicide that we read about in the paper, three more are injured, and a third of those that are injured are severely injured with brain injuries or spinal cord injuries. In fact, gunshot wounds is the leading cause of brain injury and spinal cord injury in males between the ages of 15 and 28 in urban areas. Brain injuries cause permanent brain impairment. With a brain injury, you lose your, the ability to think, to reason, to behave appropriately. You lose control of movement and speech. Some victims of brain injuries are in permanent vegetative states and require 24-hour nursing care. Spinal cord injuries cause permanent paralysis with the inability to feel and move your arms, body, and legs. There's a loss of bowel and bladder control, and some are on ventilators in order to breathe. Both brain injuries and spinal cord injuries require extensive hospitalization rehabilitation, equipment such as manual and motorized wheelchairs, medical supplies, and medications. Most victims survive their injuries, so require these health care services for potentially 40 to 50 years. A well-known national figure, James Brady, has personally exposed America to the devastating effects of gunshot wounds. His extensive medical and rehabilitative care is testimony to the tremendous physical, mental, and psychological burdens that gunshot wounds place on the individual and the tremendous cost they impose on the health care system. Mr. Brady is an educated individual with health care insurance, with a huge support network, with a supportive employer who will assist in the financial burden of a lifelong injury. Most victims of violence do not have the advantages that Mr. Brady has. This causes new and great challenges to the health care system. Most victims have not completed high school and were not employed prior to the injury. This causes vocational retraining and placement to be very difficult. <coughs> Most victims of violence have very limited, if any, support networks, such as family support, to assist them in coping with their disabilities. Therefore, the health care team is usually the primary support network for these patients. This places an enormous psychological burden on the health care providers. <coughs> Many times there is no safe environment to which these patients may return when they are ready to leave the hospital. As a result, many receive unnecessarily prolonged hospitalization and treatment until a social worker is able to find placement. Often nursing home placement at enormous cost is required for these youth 
because there is no one to take them home. Many victims of violent crime have no health care insurance. Lack of funding may result in health care providers withholding or providing inadequate care or services. This is an enormous ethical burden on the health care providers. Many victims of violence have a hostile, uncooperative attitude toward health care professionals. This reaction to conflict is the only way many of these individuals know to respond to such a devastating, life-changing event. They have not led goal-directed lives, nor had hope for control of their futures. Therefore, the health care provider spends more time designing behavioral plans and compliance programs than doing actual physical rehabilitation. Victims of violence sometimes even threaten the safety of the health care provider. These victims of violence with brain injuries or spinal cord injuries can potentially live 40 to 50 years with their disabilities. Uninsured or underinsured clients who require multiple extensive hospitalizations, surgeries, therapy, equipment, and medication over that period of time place continued stress on the health care system. In response to the increasing violence in D.C., National Rehab Hospital began a trauma prevention program about five years ago. Our mission is to educate the area's youth on the devastating effects of brain injury and spinal cord injury. We have made presentations to over 10,000 students. The most compelling component of our program is a brain injured or spinal cord injured individual describing their personal struggle to the students. This is usually the first time the students have seen someone in a wheelchair and the students are shocked. Trauma prevention programs are not enough. Legislation has greatly reduced the incidence of motor vehicle accidents causing brain injuries and spinal cord injuries through seat belt and helmet laws. Legislation is needed to reduce brain injury and spinal cord injury from gunshot wounds. To date, there is no cure for spinal cord injury or for brain injuries. The only way to stop this epidemic is to prevent these injuries by attacking the root cause, violent crime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Whitesell. Uh, Mr. Lopez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at this time, I would formally request to submit my written testimony into public document and then use the remaining portion of my time to summarize my testimony. Without uh, objection, the entire statement will be included in the record and you can summarize. Thank you. First off, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify before the Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations Subcommittee on this critical issue of violence prevention. My name is Homer Charles Lopez, Director of the Prevention Services for the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Previously, I served the state of Massachusetts as the Project Director of the Adolescent Violence Prevention Project. Today, I'm here as a psychiatric social worker to represent the National Association of Social Workers, which currently has over 145,000 members throughout the United States and abroad and is the largest association of professional social workers in the world. Mr. Chairman, because you are a social worker, you know that we are uniquely positioned to respond effectively to the problems associated with violence, particularly as it affects youth, as it affects families, and victims. Social workers provide the largest percentage of mental health services in the United States. In addition, the basic social work tenets of respect for cultural values, empowerment of individuals, and attention to nonviolent ways of dealing with conflict, and an understanding of how social policies can affect the behaviors of individuals make social workers a vital participant in the public discourse on violence prevention. As you proceed in the hearing, to articulate the components of mental health services for a health care reform initiative. You have heard from testimonies today how violence has impacted young people and it has, how violence has impacted victims and families. We're all in this together. Social workers, psychiatrists, psychologists, physical therapists, 
policemen, Department of Justice, Department of Housing. We all know the consequences of violence, and we're now beginning to see how then violence prevention can begin to turn the tide back. In that course, I then would advocate in recommending to you, sir, is a linkage in the creation of, of a basic infrastructure that will begin to coordinate, plan, and implement violence prevention strategies among all the interdepartmental agencies. As you know, those agencies and organizations in the community, on the front lines, schools, churches, universities, community-based organizations, family agencies, are all in, the, in this process of integrating or participating in some component of violence prevention, providing young people with an opportunity, some alternatives, some choices, but this is not enough. We have to be critically linked as primary preventionists into mental health services to begin then to offer young people an alternative in so much as in having a, an opportunity to see somebody who gives respect, see, see and have an opportunity to talk to somebody who cares. This will be the, the secondary primary prevention initiative. Linkage with primary and secondary initiatives will begin then to articulate a foundation of services of information and referral for young people, families, groups, and individuals. Together with this, what is critically needed also as a recommendation is training and technical assistance to all those organizations on the front line to begin then to move, as Dr. Kellerman was articulating, the research and evaluation components within their programs. To begin to use, utilize those strategies in building comprehensive continuum of care so primary, secondary preventionists could then have alternatives to treatment. So primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of prevention will then have a continuum of care that is what's critically needed in this health care reform. Treatment around substance abuse, medical, will offer the opportunity to get it straight and then get out. Within any health care reform initiative, what is, what is vitally needed is a universal access. Universal access to these health care services on the same terms and, and conditions that will exist for physical health care. Also, I would recommend to ensure federal, strong federal and continued commitment to mental health care through adequate funding for the Center for Mental Health Services, Substance Abuse Services, Mental Health Services Administration, and the program the center administers. Linked with these services, of course, will be the public health initiatives, DOE initiatives, Department of Justice initiatives, all working together on a strategic plan providing that continuum of care that was previously articulated. Also recommended that the linkages among mental illness, that we establish linkages among mental illness, chemical dependency, and other physical illnesses in public policy decision making. Establish inter-system linkages with other public programs, such as those articulated or re related to education, employment, housing, and justice system that will critically affect the individuals with mental health disorders and lead to a more, and lead to, and, and give opportunity for young individuals and families to have an opportunity to do, gain care. As previously articulated in, in some of the previous testimony, the individual articulations were made around what can we do as public or as preventionists or mental health preventionists in this, in this system. What, what was articulated was more handgun control, violence prevention in schools, parent education, early childhood education, comprehensive health education in schools, and job training for young people. All of these recommendations are very important elements and components of prevention. But basic, basic foundation is articulation of respect and equity in, in, in putting that back into young people's conversations. Respect for relationships, respect for people's cultural differences, and then mediation, conflict resolution, Components of violence prevention then can begin to take a foothold in young people and families and parents' lives. These are all critical recommendations, Mr. Chairman, and I would respectfully then offer myself for more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lopez. Dr. Wright. Good 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Is this on? Sorry. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dr. Joseph Wright. I am Assistant Medical Director of the Emergency Medical Trauma Center at Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. I'm also an Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. I'd like to thank you and the committee members for this opportunity to appear before you today on behalf of Children's Hospital and the countless other health professionals working on the front lines as part of our nation's emergency medical services system. Public health nomenclature defines an epidemic as any condition, biologic or social, the occurrence of which is clearly in excess of normal expectancy. Make no mistake about it, violence in America is a public health problem, a problem of epidemic proportions raging out of control. The prime contributor to the carnage on our streets is firearm-related violence. Mr. Chairman, over the past 10 years, I've worked in pediatric emergency departments in your home district in Brooklyn, in Congressman Payne's district in Newark, and here in Washington, D.C. I've witnessed firsthand the tremendous toll exacted on our young people by this epidemic of violence. No matter how many times we hear the numbers, they are still staggering. 200 million firearms in America, including 70 million handguns and 1 million semi-automatic weapons. For African American males, a lifetime probability of being murdered of 1 in 27. Men of color represent the only segment of the population here in the District of Columbia in which life expectancy is actually decreasing. As an African American and the father of two young boys, these are very disturbing figures. During the time it will take to conduct this hearing, throughout America, 14 people, including two children, will be shot dead. However, mortality statistics don't nearly tell the entire story. They merely represent the tip of the iceberg. For every childhood death as a result of violent injury, another 40 children are hospitalized, and over 1,100 are treated in emergency departments. The economic burden of this morbidity is estimated at $18 billion annually. As a killer of 30,000 Americans last year, firearm violence has to be treated by health professionals as an infectious scourge in the same way that polio and smallpox were a generation ago. In fact, this philosophy has already begun to emerge in the public health community as evidenced by the degree of academic discourse at last week's annual meeting of the American Public Health Association in San Francisco. During the four-day conference, there were no fewer than 58 different papers, panels, and presentations devoted to the scholarly discussion of violence and violence prevention. The time-tested public health model that has been used effectively to eliminate infectious diseases promote tobacco and alcohol warning labels, and initiate seatbelt seat and bicycle helmet safety legislation must be employed to tackle this monster, a monster that is destroying a generation of young people and threatening the next. Initiating the public health intervention model must always begin with comprehensive surveillance and tracking systems. Only with detailed information and a complete database can we learn more about what strategies will be effective and how to implement them. However, we can't limit our efforts to collecting numbers. Broad-based curricula in violence education and nonviolent conflict resolution must be introduced at the elementary school level and reinforced through integrative programs specifically tailored to the identified needs of the target populations. Such initiatives must be community-based, culturally sensitive, and well-funded. Each and every level of government must be prepared to financially support enhanced research in this area. No institutional or programmatic budget should be approved without a line item earmarked for violence prevention. It will, be a far more, it will be far more expensive in the long run to continue to pay for escalating levels of trauma care and rehabilitation than to fund programs that will promote behavioral and attitudinal change in our youth and by doing so become self-perpetuating for future generations. In my remaining few moments, I'd like to leave you with an anecdote that haunts me each and every day that I continue to encounter young victims of violence. Just at the end of the last school year, I cared for two young boys who had been shot in a well-publicized incident at a public swimming pool. Their injuries were non-life-threatening, and after initial trauma assessment and stabilization, I took some time to talk with the youngsters alone. 
I was struck by the impassivity and mundane nature with which they described their ordeal. It was as if being shot was as ordinary as walking down the street. With great animation and bravado, they told me about routine, routinely hearing gunshots and witnessing acts of violence in their neighborhood. However, more quietly, they both admitted fearfulness about returning to the community center where the incident had occurred. It was then that I realized that for many of our youngsters, the issue was not so much the fear of death, but more so the fear of how to continue living. Once again, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you and the other committee members for the, allowing me this opportunity to share my views and concerns. If I or Children's National Medical Center can be of any assistance to you or your colleagues, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Wright. At this time, I'd like to call on Mr. Alley. Thank you, Chairman Towns. I'm Fred Alley, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Brooklyn Hospital Center in Brooklyn, New York. I've been serving uh, the community and the hospital since 1968 and the last 16 years as his president, so I'm well acquainted with the very specific uh, details of violence and the hospital. We're a 650-bed tertiary care, multi-site acute care teaching institution and serve some of the poorest and most medically underserved communities in New York. Uh, diversity of our community I suppose it can be best to characterize by telling you that we have a language bank that's readily utilized by our social work department, our emergency services people, and others of 54 different languages in order to communicate with the people that come and seek refuge at the hospital. These communities should be very familiar to you, such as Bedford-Stuyvesant, Crown Heights, Fort Greene, Bushwick, Williamsburg, Flatbush, and others of uh, equal reputation. The problems that those communities face are synonymous with American cities, poverty, unemployment, drug abuse, and violence. When asked to speak about the effects of violence on the hospital last Monday, I asked for an assessment of emergency room visits <clears throat> that very morning. I learned that of the 105 patients who had arrived since midnight, 10 percent, mostly by ambulances, <clears throat> were the direct result of violence. Seven were still in the emergency room. Three had been in, admitted to the inpatient service. Still being treated by the way of example were two children involved in violent sexual crimes, one a 16-year-old rape victim and one a sexually abused boy. Both certainly will require significant follow-up care by our medical and support staff. A police officer had just come in with a head injury sustained while trying to apprehend a criminal. A young woman, an attempted suicide, was being sutured and treated. A young man, the victim of a violent hit-and-run accident, would most likely be admitted after extensive surgery. A chronic drug and alcohol abuser had been brought in by the EMS Emergency Medical Services Ambulance with unexplained head trauma. A man who had been shot two weeks before came back to have his just damaged cast around the site of his gunshot wound replaced. He will require extensive follow-up and possible surgery and rehabilitation in order to restore full function to his injured arm. This was a typical Monday morning. Friday and Saturday nights are still worse. <clears throat> and it is interesting to note that with the exception of the 16-year-old girl and the police officer, none of these patients had any insurance. It will be up to the hospital to work with them to see if Medicaid benefits or emergency services benefits for coverage can be obtained. Otherwise, they, like 10 percent of the approximate 90 percent emergency room visits that are the direct result of violence in our street and homes, will be without any coverage. But the financial cost does not end in the emergency room. The vast majority of those who arrive will require admission to the hospital. In 1992, for example, fully 10 percent of all our inpatient admissions were assigned E-code in the International Classification of Diseases categories. These are diagnoses which give evidence of external causes of injury. Although these codes include natural disasters, accidental poisonings, and the like, it is safe to assume that a large portion of these 2,400 patients in 92 were victims of violence of some sort. Let's assume conservatively, an average cost of $5,000 per patient, and I am certain 
that these patients were considerably more complex than our average hospital inpatient admission. It would be a conservative estimate then to say caring for these direct admissions of violence cost the hospital center in excess of $12,500,000 in 1992. And this is just for inpatient care. It does not include their follow-up and rehabilitation, which has been described appropriately earlier. It is difficult to determine precisely the financial toll is violent exacts on the urban hospital as an essential health care provider, as a safety net, if you will, to the community. From our overstressed emergency room to overcrowding in the 100 percent occupied inpatient beds, other factors occur. It frightens hospital employees, places extreme financial burden, and clearly has become the greatest cause of pain and suffering in our cities. It is instructive to consider why violence has become some, such an enormous problem in health care. Principal among these has to do with the problem of substance abuse. Certainly increased drug and alcohol abuse accounts for a significant portion of the overcrowding of today's urban hospital. In New York City, researchers suggest that as many as 38 percent of all hospital emergencies had some relationship to cocaine abuse. The National Institute for Drug, Drug, Drug Abuse reports that thousands of additional deaths are caused each year in our cities as a result of violent crimes associated with illicit drug use. Statistics from the Health Systems Agency of New York City shows that 1.5 percent of all inpatient admissions in northern Brooklyn are directly related to substance abuse. The impact of drug abuse extends beyond just the user. <clears throat> the, uh, the becomes the financial uh, problem and the crimes that are per uh, perpetrated in order to obtain drugs to the spouses and the children who are victims of physical and sexual abuse by drug users to the unborn and to those hurt by violent crimes while committing and using drugs. But the chronic uh, drug abuse pass for violence as well as for abusers in New York City indicates that 45 percent of those individuals autopsied were found to be cocaine abusers and users and died as a res direct result of their violent crime. However, the cost of drug and alcohol related violence to the health care system is magnified by the widespread accessibility of handguns. Although the accessibility of handguns does not correlate with increased incidence of violence, illegal handguns do correlate positively with increased severity of injuries sustained as a result of violence in the total number of homicides. And although mortality across the U.S. has been declining, death related to handguns has become the second leading cause for death in children. In northern Brooklyn, the community that I serve in central Brooklyn, homicide has become one of the leading causes of death and substance abuse is next on that list. But guns and substance abuse are only two causes of violence in America. The U.S. Justice Department reports that the rate of violent crimes in the U.S. rose 60 percent during the 1980s. This overall increase has an undeniable uh, direct and enormous impact on the operations of the urban hospital and ultimately on its financial stability. Finally, on that Monday morning in our emergency room, a hospital employee was treated for injuries sustained as a result of being struck by violent patients. Unfortunately, this is not, not uncommon. I have seen in the pediatric service of the hospital a woman attack a nurse. The attacker was an AIDS victim, scratching and spitting in the face of the hospital employee, saying, I want you to die too. This last example highlights the direct impact that violence has on hospitals, an impact that goes far beyond the, f the financial. It goes to the very people that are pledging their lives to, ca to care for the public health of the community. The American Hospital Association reports that the number of reported assaults in hospitals increased from 1,435 in 1988 to almost 1,800 in 1989, the most recent years for which statistics are available. While the majority of these assaults were directed at hospital employees in cities such as New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, intra-gang violence has begun to spread to hospitals where rival gang members are being treated. The cost of in-hospital violence are tremendous to the personnel. According to a survey by the Emergency Nurses Association, members' greatest job-related concern is that of security. 
While the threat of violence is not limited to urban hospitals, it is particularly problematic in New York City. Barry Feinstein, president of the Teamsters Local 237, which represents security officers, in talking about impact, quoted, reported, I quote, in the course of a year, as many as one third of our people will miss work because they've either been shot, knives, struck with lead pipes, pipes, or otherwise physically beaten. The sad truth, he added, is that guns, as well as other dangerous weapons, are in the hospital and are being used. Hospitals such as the Brooklyn Hospital Center <clears throat> are operating after state and local cutbacks in funding, combined with the most recent decision to reduce Medicare funding even further. They have strained our budget, they have strained our personnel. As the sole provider of care to a medically underserved community, the hospital center is doubly burdened. In addition, the emergency rooms are already overutilized by poor community members who do not have access to primary care. The solution, a strong, multifaceted solution is necessary to reduce impact. First, we must continue to find and improve our ways that address the problems that create violence the inner city poverty, unemployment, and substance abuse. I urge you to continue and expand the war on drugs and to pass realistic legislation to reduce the availability and use of illegally obtained weapons that are wreaking havoc on our streets and in our hospitals. But it is most critical that you address these issues within the context of reform of our health care system, universal access, primary and preventive care, and rational levels of funding, especially taking cognizance of the attack on the Medicare program. It must become one of your priorities. Hospitals are, as essential providers are perfectly positioned to work with, to develop primary care outreach centers, which we have done, employing people within the community, students and others, to work in an outreach program, training, educating, and talking through issues in the community. It works. I have seen it work firsthand, getting the victims to speak to other victims. We must also consider the essential costs associated with as we transform the system from one that's acute care oriented to primary care. It does not happen overnight. Safety nets must be established. Otherwise, more harm can be done than good, in my opinion. And in closing, I thank you, Congressman Towns, for your leadership in developing your letter to the President on behalf of all hospitals in the country and drawing to his attention the essential area of continued Medicare funding. I'll be pleased to answer questions. Right, thank you very much, Mr. Ali. And also let me thank you for the outstanding job that you're doing under very adverse conditions. Uh, uh, we appreciate your leadership as well. And, uh, look forward to working very closely with you in terms of solving some of the problems that we're confronted with. Uh, let me just sort of raise with uh, all of you, uh, in terms of your work um, and what you're doing and some of the things you've, you've experienced, uh, uh, for us coverage under the health care reform bill, what would each of you suggest as the kind of benefits we should cover that are not available to patients you're currently treating or experiences that you've encountered over the past several years that you've been involved in terms of health care uh, delivery? What's there that maybe uh, that should be covered that's not covered? From, from my vantage point, Mr. Chairman, I uh, would like to advocate... Pull another mic there. Uh, Pull another mic. I think okay. that was not on. That's not? Pull another one. That was not working. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Wright. From my vantage point, Mr. Chairman, I uh, would like to uh, personally see uh, universal access for our youth. Uh, I think one of the um, thing, things which leads to um, high-risk youth uh, is the fact that uh, primary and preventive care tails off as children tend to um, uh, grow out of childhood and, uh, and move into adolescence. Uh, the youngsters that uh, I treat in our emergency department uh, are usually coming to the attention of health care providers only through um, acute episodes, injuries and, and uh, violent acts. Uh, they're not generally part of a, uh, a primary care system. And I think that uh, um, ensuring that these youngsters 
have access and are part of primary care services in the way that Dr. Stanton described uh, would be what I would like to see as an essential part of, of, of any type of health care reform, um, particularly uh, one which would have a focus on um, changing behaviors amongst young people. Ms. White Sale. Ms. White Sale. Two things that I would like to see covered are one, in and outpatient rehabilitation. With each passing week, the funding for inpatient rehabilitation and outpatient rehab um, are being cut. And um, this makes it much more difficult for the health care team to get accomplished everything that they need to accomplish prior to sending this person home, such as training the person, training the family, or the um, personal care attendants who will be taking care of these brain injured or spinal cord injured victims. I think a second thing would be durable medical equipment. Many of our spinal cord injury patients and brain injury patients require manual wheelchairs, motorized wheelchairs, sometimes environmental control units, sometimes ventilators, and we have a difficult pro uh, problem getting these items funded. Yeah. Mr. Alley. The primary care and emergency services um, programs, as they are outlined in the reform plan, are, are uh, admirable. They must uh, include a comprehensive nature for the non-health related, um, or the health related but non-medical doctor nurse component of health educators, community service uh, individuals, and community-based programs that can realistically work and make a difference within the community. An example of that is the uh, New York State Primary Care Grant Initiative that I can supply uh, you, uh, Chairman Towns, and others with that provides funding at a variety of levels, and it's not terribly expensive, but it works because it's at the grassroots. Uh, secondarily, we have to pay careful attention to undocumented um, aliens. They get sick. And I know there are provisions within the legislation uh, currently that provide ultimately for a reimbursement mechanism, but they are a very large part of a lot of the inner city problems. And those very people at this point in time are afraid to come to the hospital and, or to the outpatient departments or the community-based programs and, and register for fear, of being, uh, to, for fear of being found out and deported. And we must realize that they're a large part of, the, of what we're talking about right here. Mr. Lopez. I think, Mr. Chairman, along the same lines, in, in expansion of that of the community-based health educator, is an, is a commitment from the federal government to to create opportunities for community residents to have uh, equal opportunity to education for health education uh, professions. Too often is the case in the community do we, do we neglect our natural healers, the curanderas, the, the tribal healers, the things of, that, things of that nature. But then there are young people who look for opportunities uh, in health, in health professions who could have an opportunity for some for um, tuition remission programs or, or con contribution back into community service in, the, in, in, in a health care reform package. So. Um, I think young people would look and, and, and do look to, to um, health educators who are from the community, who then uh, have grown up and know the neighborhood, and uh, therefore are, have already achieved a level of trust and legitimacy because they have taken the time to, 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 change their, to take their life and, and put it back into the community. So looking at uh, opportunities to, to afford that or to create that and make that happen would be beneficial. Hey. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to echo what uh, Mr. Lopez has said, um, because in my own education, uh, the only way I was able to go to medical school was through the National Health Service Corps, um, which was functional at the time and has uh, been resurrected in, in, um, in um, uh, a reduced form uh, under the current administration. Uh, I was able to go back and uh, practice at a community-based center on the corner of Nostrand Avenue and Kosciuszko, which you know well, and uh, and serve the community that I, in which I'd grown up. My grandmother lived around the corner, and uh, um, uh, my the people I grew up with and knew very well were able to drop in um, at a moment's notice. So that uh, I, I really have to um, uh, concur with what Mr. Lopez is saying. Uh, those kinds of opportunities for 
um, uh, people from the community to go and become educated and come back to the community need to be enhanced. Let me say that um, uh, I agree with you. I think that uh, we need to do more of that and maybe uh, we can get to that if we are trying to get doctors into primary care. Maybe that's one way to strengthen the program and we might be able to attract some. I think that that's an interesting point because as it stands now that uh, with the concept that we're putting forth that we do not have enough primary care physicians. So maybe we, as we resurrect the program, maybe we can expand it and uh, that might be one route to be able to bring some folks in. Uh, it's something to look at it, at least. Also, let me just thank all of you for uh, coming because I think that the uh, whole violence is the issue that um, uh, we really must begin to address in a very serious way. And Dr. Wright, I was happy to hear that you indicated that in the conference in California, San Francisco, that at least they were beginning to talk about it and that several papers were presented. But I'm concerned over the fact that it has not gotten the attention that I feel that it, sh that it should have gotten based on information that you just passed along to us in terms of what it's doing to our hospitals, the kind of costs that's involved in, uh, uh, in medic medical uh, uh, costs alone uh, because we're not addressing it. So I'm hoping that somewhere along the line that we can uh, put more money in research. I hope that we can create a situation where we can target money to begin to deal with the problem. Because I think that some areas that the problems are somewhat unique, that they're somewhat different, and that we need to be in a position to target money to those areas to be able to address the problem. And I'm hoping that uh, uh, as a result of hearings like this, that we can begin to make the point uh, that there is a very serious problem that needs to be addressed and that it varies from one area to another, but yet it still should be addressed. So let me thank all of you very, very much for your testimony uh, coming and sharing with us. And I think that as a result of that, that you, people will be able to benefit from it greatly. Thank you very much. This hearing is now concluded. This hearing was convened to examine the increase in violent acts at all levels of society and how it affects the public health. Later this morning at 8 a.m., it's a live viewer call-in program with House Minority Leader Robert Michael. The Republican from Illinois recently announced he would not seek re-election in 1994. Coming up next, Education Secretary Richard Riley addresses students at Walt Whitman High School in Bethesda, Maryland. This week on America and the Courts, see a preview of Campbell v. Acoff Rose Music Incorporated. The case involves the rap group...